I am in this pretty safe environment, I think, okay, in saying this. So when we look at a child wearing a mask, at least I do, I'm horrified. And I, I think to myself, and I've seen it, I've already witnessed it, the children born today will not know that what they were born into is not normal. So I'm going to challenge each and every one of you, along with myself, that there are multiple things that we have been born into that we think are normal, but are not. One of those things for me was um, that it was okay and right for the United States, even patriotic, for the United States of America to illegally overthrow the Hawaiian Kingdom. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shock you for those of you who aren't maybe prepared for this. The, the Hawaii is not a state of the United States today. It never has been. It is illegally occupied. You might have to let that sink in with you a little bit, but again, that's my challenge to you, is that something that we grew up, including myself, including my uncles and aunties who are you know, now well and past their entire lives, they grew up in a thought process and a system that they thought was real, but it's not. So with that challenge, I'd like to bring <laughs> Allison on up. So I'm so excited to be here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Allison McDowell. I have a blog, it's called Wrench in the Gears, and um, I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, and I kind of introduced myself as a mom and an independent researcher, and I, I fell into a lot of this through education activism, um, and it really blossomed over this past year as sort of this health scenario simulation program has been rolling out, um, that a lot of the work that I did in the education space is directly applicable to the other aspects of what I sort of frame as a biosecurity state. So I have a really long presentation that I'm going to break across the, today's lunch and tomorrow's lunch, and then I have a wrap up at the end of the day tomorrow around children. Um, but I brought, I, I think a lot of what we're doing is part of an energetic engagement. And I think it's sacred work, and I think they would like, most of the framing of today and tomorrow are around a, a game, uh, a game that is happening within a global digital police state uh, to benefit uh, a, a small number of people with concentrated wealth and power at the expense of the masses of humanity. And that's global humanity. It's not simply people in Tucson or people in the United States or, and, and what they most want is for us to fight one another and to, to, to dig into boxes and identities and to not further interrogate and look up upwards at the people who are really controlling the whole system. And so, so my framework, I offer a particular lens. I will say it's not necessarily everybody's lens, but if it's, if it's useful to you, I hope it will expand and give you some ways of fitting pieces together. Um, I brought, these are my little, my, my mothers, the mothers. Um, and I have a friend in the UK and her name is Isabella and she publishes a, a magazine called Women Earth Soul. And so she, she had us do, uh, a, a gathering over the winter and to, to assert the, the power of, of mothers and women in this time. And she said, Allison, would you do something? And I said, sure. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do is I wanted to go to Wharton Business School, which is in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania where I am, and I wanted to do a revocation of consent against these human capital bond finance programs that they've been rolling out. And so I made these little, little ladies with scraps of felt um, just their hand sewed, and they're actually more like poppets. I, I collect natural objects. I work um, at a botanical garden part-time, and I'm not a horticulturalist. I have a desk job, but I, I, I gather leaves and twigs and shells and things that speak to me. And so I put all of this natural love into these little dolls, and, and I took them with me for that. And they, they've come with me to various other revocations, so I thought they would hold the space. And, and then this is also from Driftwood on the river, on the Schuylkill River where, where I work. And to me, um, they're trying to put us in this panopticon. And to me, that this is sort of the, the, um, the inversion of the police state panopticon is that, that is about nature. It is about natural life and that we are here today as keepers of natural life in the face of 
uh, synthetic biology, really, and, and things that are going on. And so, um, yeah, I, this stuff I'm going to talk about is heavy, um, but I come, people always say, you say it in such a light way. <laughs> because I don't think they want us, like, I don't want to show up and have everybody bummed out so that we give them more en energy to them to carry on this agenda. But I think knowing the, the, the map of the terrain, that's how I sort of feel myself as giving people a, a sense of where things are headed. Not knowing that they'll be able to scale this, I want to say this up front, I do not know that they'll be able to impose all of the things that they contemplate. Clearly, cybernetics is something that's been, uh, you know, in the thought process since World War II, you know, in the technocracy much even earlier than that, and they haven't done it yet. So I don't think that we are powerless. I think we are quite powerful, and, but we need to both be able to have the courage to look at the truth of what is happening, and then to use our, uh, sacred energetic presence and however that presents to you in your faith practice and this is again global and so I'm I'm coming to say there's not any one right way to do that is from your authentic caring self and connection to your creator to take that stand against this planetary m computer that they're trying to build so I've actually um, if, if you haven't heard I've, I have it came to me uh, early in the spring, like, because it's hard to keep a feeling of agency while all of this is going on, right? You feel somewhat powerless. And this idea of dandelions came to my head. And, I d and you know, as a symbol of this resistance movement, because it is, it's natural, it's a medicinal, it, 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 it feeds people, it's, it actually is a liver cleanse, so it's against anger, because they also want us angry at one another, even at the bad guys. Um, it has the whole transmutation from the bud to the flower to the blossom to the seeds, it gets everywhere. It's on every, it's around the world except everywhere except Antarctica, I think. And it's free. Like it's, it's, a, it's a plant of the people, really. And in many respects, in the most botanically impoverished communities, uh, the dandelions are more prevalent even than in the suburbs, as we've seen in the previous lectures about Monsanto, <laughs> you know, the glypso, yeah, the roundup. So, so the dandelions came to me. So I've been having people send me dandelions, and I've been doing um, ceremonies of actually applying like water and dandelions to the, the, the thresholds of these institutions of power to sort of transmute this and to, to, to take back our power and to say that what's happening to the children that is not okay. So we, I did one in New York City, and, and actually we closed it out at the Federal Reserve, the New York Federal Reserve building, and I have a friend with a gong. So we gonged and we sang and we said, you don't have our permission, and we laid down the dandelions. And then we, we did this labyrinth maze at the end. And at the end of, in the middle of this labyrinth, because the other pieces with dandelions, um, I, I read that um, Hecate, uh, fed Theseus on dandelions for 30 days before he fought the Minotaur. And I feel that Wall Street, this, this global financial apparatus, which the previous presentation sort of touched on, that debt finance, militarized debt finance, is represented by Wall Street. And so the Minotaur, so we will take our dandelions to the Minotaur. So I'm just going to read this. This came with a, ship, a, a bit of dandelions. And if you can see, it's, it's construction paper. And there's, this is on a paper towel with ballpoint pen and like little... Um, dot markers, I guess. And so just to set the tone, um, children's growth is guided by love. Thirst for power and control has no jurisdiction here. So everything I, I say, I just want to give that back context is we are, we are the keepers of life. And we come from all different practices, belief systems, histories, levels of knowledge or lack of knowledge. And um, so you know, we'll get it going. So, okay, so let's see. So um, it's, it's farmer's market time in Philadelphia again, and my husband's great, and he always goes to the, the Mennonite stand, and he gets this wildflower bouquet, and I was, but he doesn't like to arrange it, he just likes to plop it in. So he's like, you know, can you put them in nice? And this was a particularly wild bouquet, the, um, because it's the early spring wildflowers in the peonies, and you know, I, put, I was putting it in, and I thought like the composition that in this, everyone has their gifts. Everyone, it's knowing your gifts and how to give them. Which is Robin Wall Kimmer is one of the, the people whose teachings I follow. And so I feel like the gift that I have to, is to arrange these blooms in a vase so that, they, that, that you can understand them together. And so what so many of the speakers today are offering different blooms for this vase, their gifts, their gifts and advocacy around um, proper local control for money systems, around safe en environments for children to play in, around nature, around um, health, you know, health choices. All of these things are everyone's gifts. And so I go wide, not deep. 
So I'm the, I'm the vase assembler. So that's how, sort of how I see myself. And on, on Twitter, um, I can't remember, it was in response, but someone said that's, that's the one thing that they can't code is a soul. They can't code a soul. So this is the backdrop. And, and this is a contrast to that, that bouquet, right? So we're moving into a cybernetic age. In, in World Economic Forum, these folks have told us straight up sort of what their plan is for this um, coming age is that they, they want to meld human life, natural life, not just humans, but particular humans, um, into this uh, digital system, the cybernetic system. And, you know, for a while, my, my experience has continued to unfold. You know, it was around education, then it was around poverty, then it was around finance, and then it was around smart cities and infrastructure, and then really only lately has it come around to transhumanism, which is, which is Alana's like area of expertise, but the, this idea of virtualizing life in these systems. So we're, we're really approaching almost like it's a Frankenstein moment. And they're, they're framing it to us as um, you know, innovation, right? Where we should all be so excited that this is happening. And um, you know, I equate it to uh, like the golem bringing in like these robots. They would like to feed our life force to learn us in every tiny detail, not to empower us, but to actually transform us into a robotic simulation that, that is under their full control. And that legacy comes with the golems, but also there's the, the Krat, I think, which is the straw figure in Estonia. And it's interesting because Estonia is the model smart city e-government. And their initiatives, they specifically call out their initiatives around good AI as the CROT law. CROT law. So they're already saying straight up that this is the plan and they're working at programmable life and programmable matter. So I will, I will make a note here that this system here, my friend Joseph brought it to my attention, it is actually open source because the goal is to have this cheap and widely available. You can see it says you can print it yourself for $350, they're trying to bring the price points. You know, you imagine what we had with phones and virtual reality, like this is going to drop so that everyone has one of these, right? There's, there, I, I sort of quipped it's part of the school uniform is like, where's your headset on there? The donors to that includes Columbia Engineering School. And that's something that Patrick has touched on in the past is the technocracy really like was coming out of the Columbia School of Industrial Engineering. So there are these longer legacies in place that keep reverberating forward, right? The people who were involved in industrial engineered society are now interested in um, tracking and programming your brainwaves. So I feel like in many respects we're at this crux, and as I mentioned in my opening remarks, it's this question of, of are we doing webs of relationship, and again, I, in this moment where everyone feels so panicked, it's like, how do I take care of myself and my family? You know, how do I make sure that we're okay or that my local community is okay? And I think understanding this engagement as a web, like not the spatial web or the internet web, but a natural web, the mycelia, the fungi, that we are, inter we are stronger together and that, that no one is going to survive Goldman Sachs and DARPA on their own and you know hiding out in a cave or if you do that that existence will not probably be super fulfilling for very long so we actually need to knit these webs of relationship together and I feel like um, especially here on this geography my training is actually in art history and cultural landscape and so I always like to know like what is this place that I've come to right and looking at at the Apache Wars right looking at that engagement if we understand those people were being erased off of their lands and off of their faith practice and off of their connection to their land-based existence. And they, like for the most part, this is more earlier on with colonization, no one had any words to understand what was about to happen. Right, when, when, when folks, you know, the first, you know, invaders came over, the people on the shore, they didn't know what was in the heads of those people because they came from a different way of life. Their, their way of life was very different. And so there was no common understanding, right? And so I feel like we're at this threshold now again of this, this conquest is about to happen of biological life and no one has the words or even the mental framework to conceive of it yet. And so we are kind of like sitting ducks unless that we can, we can come together. So um, the foil to the, the natural life web of relationship, um, and again, I was, I was hoping to get out to that Vatican telescope, but it's too far. But that is, is a very much a symbol of people standing against um, pr you know, pr progress, innovation, domination of nature and the cosmos with man-made tools is Michael Crow, who, who I think has quite a larger than life presence in the state as president of Arizona State University, but also a representative as the founding board chair of InQtel, which is the CIA's venture capital firm. 
Um, one of the main entities that is funding all of the, the autonomous everything to create the smart world that will replace us. So there's like, he, they're funding among those Niantic, which was the Pokemon Go augmented reality, the test bed for that, right? So that's, no one really thought at the time like, oh, this is actually the, the beginning of the global police state, right? But it's entertaining, um, but you know, it's backed by the CIA, right? So that's, there are these two juxtapositions. So again, 30 years, they were in this engagement for 30 years in the natural landscape. Um, and they were, a lot of this was done, I have a friend, um, a new friend actually, but someone who I work I respect very much, Stephen Newcomb, and he spent his adult life, he's um, uh, Lenape and Shawnee, I think, looking into the basis of Indian law and the papal bulls and going to Europe and reading them in Latin and deconstructing the coded language of domination policies that enabled the world that we are currently living in today and that may ultimately end up as a military video game. But the trajectory of this, that this isn't something that just recently went wrong. Our understanding of essentially the ability to secure resources and land because people were conceived of as uncivilized and heathens, right? Like that's the papal bull, the doctrine of discovery or domination, as Stephen calls it. Um, and dom is subdue or submission. So even when we have our free dom moralities, it's where we've got the dom in there. <laughs> we should maybe consider the, the dom part of the, the freedom because it is subliminally adding this domination element. Um, and so I would just say, as we move forward, thinking about the world that they're building that is likely going to be digital, will the heathens be the people who want to remain biological humans, right? And is, and is the religion, is the faith practice that is being imposed, the, the scientism, right? And so where those people were in that moment where, you know, the Vatican on behalf of empire laid out a law that, that justified that transition, that makeover of this continent, the next makeover of the continent as I see it is a virtualization and that will be done probably using similar tactics because these military folks, they study all of the military tactics and they know that the, the US military apparatus is very, very interested in asymmetrical warfare and how that happens. And so I would, I would expect, you know, Fort Huachuca is just right down there that they have a very, very much in their minds the history of what happened in this space and how this applies moving forward. So how did I get here? It's kind of a heavy topic. I really thought I was just fighting school closures. <laughs> you know, I, and I think that's because I have fresh eyes and I'm not immersed in just one thing, I could see a lot. But um, Boston Consulting Group closed a bunch of schools, 23 schools in uh, 2013 in Philadelphia laid off 3,000 teachers. And at the time I was still like, a, like NPR listening, like well-meaning liberal person saying, well, that's not fair. That's not fair, you know? And I would show up and I would try to make it fair thinking that it wasn't structured, that the structure wasn't set up to be not fair. And so this is me and my friend Tanya were lying in front of Girard College in the driveway and the US, the, the Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce was gonna have a meeting at this uh, private school with has a wall all the way around it and a gate, which was the site of one of the largest uh, Northern civil rights struggles, the integration of Girard College. And they were going to have a secret meeting, not a secret, but you could only go if you were a member to plan out the role of business and education for our city's children. Right, and so, so that was my way in. I started mapping money and power. I make these maps, and I, I can't remember the gentleman's name. Someone would probably know better. There's, a, there's an activist artist who would make these other big maps, and then I think he, he met an early end, unfortunately. But I was using the software, and this is called Little Sis, and actually they would have like research teams in all these cities, and I never could understand why nobody wanted to look at what I was looking at. And it was because it's funded by the people doing the things I'm looking at, and then ultimately I keep getting kicked off. But like it was, seeing a system, right? And I think for me that helped very much to say, it's not, I think some people will, because we've been conditioned to, to um, narrowness, that it's about, um, you know, I'm this person, those people are the problem, right? That you, it's narrow, they never zoom back. And once you zoom back, you realize it's global, like Michael Crow is as much in Beijing, as Beijing is in Silicon Valley, as they're working, running money for SoftBank, you know, in Japan and the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund. It's, they have their own webs of relationships. They're in their own parties and we're not necessarily invited. So, so that's, so I would map power and the stories would tell things, these aren't hidden. I look at LinkedIn profiles, I look at webinars, I look at white papers. Like, I, nobody drops me a hot tip. Like, really, I mean, they figure that nobody who would have opposed this agenda would bother looking at what they, they've got their own club. So I dug around in their own club. And then the other piece that clearly what we're dealing with is, is 
this new version of psychological warfare, which has a long legacy, you know, in you know, the Mockingbird Press and COINTELPRO and, and, but for the most part, I think people here wouldn't think that their government would do, a lot of people wouldn't think their government would do that to them, right? Like, but the indigenous people would think that the, you know, the government would do that to them, right? I mean, there are people who have been victimized by the structure who probably would more readily understand that their government would do that to them. So that's when I say, like, we're all back in this spot now, like, we need to know, and I'm not saying it in any particular way, but like, there were people always who knew that the government wasn't necessarily in for their best interest. And so now, the Center for the Future of War is at Arizona State University. It's funded largely by Eric, uh, New America and Eric Schmidt and Google. And so they have um, four areas of focus, which is autonomous weapons, um, drones, and I can't remember the fourth, but it's weaponized narrative is one of them. So like this was all in the works. And, and clearly at the time that I was looking into this, I didn't realize what the narrative was going to be, but the, the narrative is around the biosecurity state. Um, so, and if you haven't seen any of the work of James Giordano, I would highly recommend it. It's quite unsettling. He's a professor of bioethics at Georgetown, and essentially he does a lot about um, ethics, sort of air quotes, around neural weapons. So, um, you know, when we're trying to make sense of how this all happened, I think it, we need to take that into account. This is a clip, um, TRADOC, Army Training uh, Doctrine and Command, had a gathering, they have a division called the Mad Scientist Division, and they met at Arizona State, and I think this is 2016, and so Crow is giving the opening remarks, and I edited it down to a shorter clip just to, uh, like to give a little context. One project that we have under the Minerva program coming out of the Secretary of Defense's office is a project where we're looking at functional magnetic resonance imaging outcomes of hate messages from Islamic fundamentalists going into human beings so that we can determine whether or not human beings respond differently to those messages by looking at the actual functionality of their brains. Guess what? It triggers an inner core, deep, antecedent, old, old, old evolutionary characteristic. It's a messaging that triggers, based on our research to date, triggers a certain kind of biological response. Now that we have the means to send out such messaging, now that we have the means to communicate at scale, now that we have the means for all of this complexity, how do we manage this complexity? How do we re be responsive in engagement to conflict, to natural disasters, to biological and chemical disasters? How do we design for complexity? And so the, this mad scientist effort is the first step. You question the present design. So it's important when you look at like the, the military technology, it's, they, there's this frame Giordano talks about dual use, right? And, and I, I think one of the other speakers said there's the reason they give and there's the real reason, right? And so a lot, and not to say that it isn't, like that they weren't interested in, in those particular, you know, groups, but if you understand, that was embedded within the religious and philosophy division. And I think there's been a lot shared around the health choice um, discussion around neutralizing people's faith. People's faith and their understanding of something larger than themselves is a very much a driving motivator. Now they framed it within a geopolitical construct, right? So that would make it very palatable. But I, I, I could easily see that similar thing being applied to other faith communities or to people who are opposing, imposed by medi uh, medical you know, interventions, right? It's that same, once you develop the technology, I mean, we saw that with the atom bomb, right? Like it's, it's rather indiscriminate. Once it's out of the box, it's out of the box. So this is stuff that has been worked on for quite some time. So um, the other piece of this for me, um, I think I mentioned transhumanism. Um, I have a friend, she was a teacher in second grade in Maine. And she was seeing weird things. Like when you trust your gut, Alana said, <laughs> trust your gut. When you see things that are weird, like understand that they're connected to something bigger. And so um, she started digging. She created this blog called Save Maine Schools. She's taken a break from it now because she has three little littles right now. But she said, you know, only click this link if you want to go down the rabbit hole. She's like, just so you know, just click this link if you want to go down the rabbit hole. And the link opened to Global Education Futures. And it was directed by Pavel Luksha, and he's out of, um, at Moscow and Skolkovo, which is sort of the Silicon Valley of Russia. And so they had developed essentially a global network of ed tech online education systems for which the US contact was Tom Vander Ark, who is a Gates Foundation guy and created the first uh, virtual school in, in Washington state um, and is now a venture capitalist in ed tech um, in this. And then so, so then the down I fell. So one of the things that they have on their website, they would do things called foresight work 
So they would take trends and they would project forward. So these weren't things that had necessarily already happened, but they were taking existing technologies and themes and projecting forward. So this is a map that they had for education through 2035. This is just a piece, it's a giant map. But the thing that really jumped out at me was this idea of the people nair. Fortunes made up of people and depending on the quality of the human capital. And then also the forest of minds, and that is the hive mind technology that they're working to, to build. So in addition to you know, who might think that the, the power structure doesn't have their interests at heart, it's indigenous people and enslaved people, right? Because this people there is really going back to an era of enslavement, but it being reframed as we're investing in human capital. But we're investing in human capital for a world that's actually going to be post-human, which is, which is the problem. So the underpinning of this and what I bring that not many other people actively talk about is the human capital bond market part. And this is something that we're seeing now with the rise. Um, it blends both poverty management um, essentially the privatization of the social welfare net as an investment opportunity to invest in poor people and speculate on that. Um, and that is going to be coming with these biometric uh, medical geofencing programs, <laughs> which is what I call the, the vaccine passports. Um, and because they need interoperable data and they need to track you as an asset. And so that's what the, the passports are for. Um, and if you understand this as a logic principle of capital, with concentrations of wealth and power, wealth in particular, capital must flow or the system falls apart. I mean, if you stop, and that's why at the, after the last economic crash, they said, don't stop spending your money, go out, keep spending, because if you stop the whole, you know, everything where it's papered over, it shows and the, thing, the system can't ha happen. So the last global crash was based on uh, securitized debt of housing and real estate. Right? And, and, and how did that happen? Well, they needed a place to put all of that money. These people who were holding all, most of the money, these small number, couple hundred billionaires, need a place to put it. And so they would create synthetic debt products to make that happen, to keep the game going. Well, if you understand that in the decade plus since that happened, the wealth has only become more concentrated and the technology has only become more sophisticated. So the next, the only thing bigger really than real estate to create a synthetic debt product around is humans. Humans in the environment, right? And that's where the ESG investing, the environmental investing comes in. So they're developing ways to securitize people as debt products. And you are a debt burden on society. Before you were even born, they will use data analytics to say, you are a debt on society to this degree based on your genomics, based on where you live, based on your parents' educational attainment or their salaries or their health profiles. They will make all sorts of pre-crime predictions about you for these gambling products that aren't real. And none of them may ever be real. It's all a fiction. People have to understand these games are fictions, but they are fictions that the most elite, powerful actors have chosen to play together until it's inconvenient for them to play and then they make a new game. Okay? It doesn't make sense to normal people because normal people wouldn't think like this. <laughs> Sociopaths think like this, but it already happened. And in many ways, the last global economic crash set the stage because Blackstone came in and bought up all of the, is now the largest private, private rental homeowner, and they're being very repressive in their landlord practices. It, many people never got out of the gig economy. Many people lost all of their assets. It cleared the decks. So when we're looking at mass dispossession, which again, I make akin to the Indian reservations, the smart cities are the next Indian reservation, is the plan at a level that we cannot even quite imagine at this point, if they pull it off, is about that. But it's embedded in managing poverty and economic dispossession. It's an intended economic dispossession because it's that the people have been pushed out of their jobs because they will, they will say, in order to get our data to run these deals and to grow our budget, now your children will be taught by robots, now your elderly parents will be cared for by robots, now your mental health system will be a robot or an algorithm or a chat bot. All of these things are because that is the demand of this new economy, is to replace humans with systems. And to do that, it, 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 they're not just going to kill everybody, <laughs> right? Because they actually have to learn us. Part of it, like they need to, like, it's like a parasite. It's like a vampire. They need to learn us and leave us as husks. So for a while anyway, like they're going to sort of work on this thing and they're going to do it through poverty management. And poverty management has been a problem for a very, very long time, but now with digital identity and the, this securitized debt, it's going to be much worse. 
These are the asset classes. Um, I guess many of you are probably familiar, if you have global connections, how repressive things ha have been in Australia, yeah. right? So Australia is a center for a lot of this. Again, it's an island. It's, it's a, there's a lot of defense contracting there. Um, they're, they're able to impose these systems. They're, they're, they piloted the first smart blockchain social impact bond there. And this is a document that was done for Boston Consulting Group for the Australia Post. Okay? And this is all of the data that they're imagining because to them that is all profit and control all part of the larger system. And that's the World Economic Forum is talking about personal data as a new asset class. Okay, so this is about market shaping. And I'm not saying this with any, like, it is what it is, you know? It, it's about creating markets, and the markets are in data. I think I, I, I cropped that picture, but it's actually a woman jogging, and she's being chased by her data, which is quite a striking image. You know, like, it's, it's not a comforting image. The other th thing I will say about Australia is they've already, already piloted blockchain programmable money for disability benefits. Okay, so that's, they're a test bed for a lot of these things. Here are just some more images, the Internet of Bodies. If you haven't heard of that, I highly recommend look, putting, just put that in, a, in an online search and see what it comes up with. Uh, two or three years ago, I saw my first reference to the Internet of Humans. That's Roberto Viola. He's head of telecom for the EU. And I thought, whoa, since when did we j volunteer to join the Internet? <laughs> you know, like, like, what does that mean, the Internet of Humans, right? And this is, again, coming through the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, when I was working on education work, there's something called LENA that's connected with the University of Chicago, and I believe Rice, where you can see they're slipping a digital counter in that pocket, and that they put onesies on babies, and then put surveillance listening devices on them to make sure that poor parents talk to their children enough, that they use the right words. Okay, that they can be commodified, that the, that the parent-child relationship can be commodified in that way. And it's framed as social justice. It's framed as we care about these children, not to mention what other health consequences are of having. Now, I, I don't know if like, they frame it as you just do that for a few days and then we get your data profile on how you talk to your children, right? But people would say, well, why would you do that? I would never do that. Well, you will do that if your food, if they've taken you away from your job and the only way you can give food to your children is that you have to participate in the program. And that's, it's not, a, it's not going to be a voluntary thing. It's not like, I mean, there are some crazy people in Silicon Valley who just want to digitize everything and wear every device, but most, most people would not make this choice. As you can see, the Internet of Bodies, they're, um, you know, normalizing prosthetics, microchip implants, cochlear implants, uh, mind control for depression, uh, fertility measurements. Uh, tooth-mounted sensors, augmented reality glasses. This is from a report by called um, the Internet of Bodies, uh, Risks and Opportunities, <laughs> and it, by Rand. Rand got commissioned to do this, and it was Swiss Reinsurance, a former executive of Swiss Reinsurance that was managing, it's an actuarial program, right? And I mean, they've got a Bluetooth baby diaper, and an anti-drowning monitor, and a sleep tracking onesie. So these are all things, I wish that this was not real. Like, I wish that I did not have to come and tell you that there are people out there thinking that this is the world that they're imagining. And, it, and I, I very much hope, and like with all of our energetic presence, that we don't get there. But if you understand the tactics that are going to be used against you, you'll be better positioned. Because most of it is framed in very nice terms. Very nice terms. So one of the key figures in all of this, his name is uh, Jim Heckman. He, uh, as out of the University of Chicago, Nobel Prize winner, you know, the academics are all into this. They legitimize it with their policy uh, procedures and develop the equations for these markets. His market was for uh, early childhood. And so that includes everything from prenatal care all the way up to third grade. So if you ever wondered, like, the push behind the third grade's HESS scores, it's because it's an impact market. If you ever, like, start to prick up about universal pre-K, Universal pre-K is there because it's an impact market. And Goldman Sachs did the first uh, uh, social impact bond for universal, uh, pre it wasn't universal, it was a pilot, a social impact bond pilot for pre-K in Salt Lake City. Okay, Salt Lake City is a hotbed of state intelligence and biotech and ed tech and everything else. So they, they piloted this pre-K program and they said, okay, this is how it works. If um, we're gonna screen kids with our tool, like we have a tool, it's gonna tell us who we, we can fix. Because we, these children, once we've done our tool, they, they will be a burden. And if we can fix them before we can become, they're a burden, we'll save money. Look, so they predictively profile kids into being the burden before they've even done anything wrong. And then say, look, we fixed them. And look, so this slice of difference, we'll take that money in between. So they, they, they put 100 kids in pre-K funded by Goldman Sachs. Now, Goldman Sachs is a key party in these social impact bonds. They have industrial banks, and they're setting it all up. 
Um, as Ian Galloway, the San Francisco Fed said, there's one thing like you can say about social impact bonds, like everyone is different except Goldman Sachs's fingerprints are in all of them, right? So this is the Goldman Sachs, and it won't stay that way, but for now. And guess what, of the, after their pre-K, they only had uh, one of the 100 kids got uh, needed special education. That was the cost offset. They said if we give them pre-K, they won't need special education. Well, the people, even on the New York Times, said that's bogus, because even if you gave them stellar, like, you know, uh, um, you know, Waldorf pre-K and every, you know, uh, you know, tiny class sizes, you would not only have one of those hundred kids needing special education, there's a game here. And, and those of us at the time, I was really focused on public education and looking at the charters. And like, you could see how you can game the numbers. I and mean, we saw that in the earlier presentation about the, um, the exemptions, you can game the numbers. However, once you make it a number, you can game the number. Um, so either this, these were children who were deprived services, or maybe they were kids who like had English as a second language or something and were never going to need special education. They just needed some time. So it's a racket, guys. And the, the thing is, so Pritzker, this is funded by Open Society, this equation, the uh, Human Capital Economic Opportunity Group at, at Chicago. So it's like George Soros is funding the Becker Friedman School of Economics. So like, I mean, just like when I say we've got to get out of our boxes, mm -hmm. we've got to get out of our boxes because they're all in on it. It's a matter of the people in power who are running this game. Um, and so J.B. Pritzker, who at the time is now governor but wasn't then, they went up and down California pitching universal pre-K so they could run their data bonds. And, but they said, you know, we can't use the data, IQ doesn't really work, cognitive, it doesn't move enough, they didn't say for the, the hedge fund markets, but it doesn't move for hedge fund markets. He said, what we actually can change is character. We can change character, okay? So now that once you understand all of these um, Sesame Workshop apps and PBS Kids apps and these apps, it's about behavior, it's about digital behavior change. And so one of the companies that you'll see on the, on the one side, We Play Smart, it's Hatch Education. So what they did was they actually developed, that is an interactive play table that's like a, a flat screen TV that's, that's parallel to the floor. There's two fisheye lens cameras on either side and the children are supposed to play together at that table and then it scores their social behavior on a rubric. Now I have net and it has facial recognition on it and it goes to a permanent record. Okay? And so they're going to sell this as pre-K. Now, do we do parents need affordable childcare? Totally. Do, or do we need an economy where not like you can have a parent stay at home and take care of the kids? That would be great if that's their choice. You know, like they, but they make false choices. So you now you're in an economy where like you know, a two adult household needs three jobs to get by and you need affordable childcare and then that's the choice that's gonna be given to you. And when I found out that, my, uh, that kinder care, that Michael Milken was a primary investor in kinder care, you start to understand corporate childcare a lot better. Right, and this isn't this didn't come out of nowhere. That it's been long, long time coming. Um, there's this guy Tom Luce who's with Texas 2035, 2036, I think, and he's working with the Fed there on this. And he's like, you know, I'd really just like my companies to like have the kids from the age of two to college, and we'll, you know, and they'll just cream up the kids they want, right? They'll just train their workforce. But if there's no autonomy in that. Like, what happens if you get trapped on a corporate campus and you're a poet? You know, for goodness sakes, I don't know what happens. So this is this is all real. Like I've made this panopticon, sort of this infographic, because I'm trying to distill it, and I know we're going to have a, a talk about 5G in a bit, but it all runs on the telecommunication infrastructure. I didn't know there was 6G, I don't know, maybe up to 10G at this point, biosensors or something called the powder network in Salt Lake City, but it's, it's, it's digitizing your frequency, and that's why I think like the good energy part is so important. It's signals intelligence and it's frequency, and it's happening in ways that we may not, I can't put a math equation to it, some people might, but they're manipulating that. So I have from the bottom the level of the panopticon, which is tied, this will all be tied to your digital identity, and that is what the medical passports are about, is to create the interoperable permanent record tied to your biometrics. So it will start with your cells and your DNA down with nanotech and biosensors. They will track your minds and emotions, and this is all through technology. They will track your physical activity and location. They will track you in your house. They will track who you interact with. They will track, track you where you move in and outside of your house and in your larger community. They will track you where you work or go to school. They will track if you're compliant with the protocols, the pathways that they have put you on because everyone will be put on a self-improvement pathway for the future, that is the game that we're gonna talk about. They will say how productive are you on your pathway and that's you know what Patrick talks about with the technocracy, it's you know, energy credits. What do we put into you? What do we get out of you? Are we getting our, our money's worth? And then ultimately, what is your threat score? Because most of this stuff is running through the fusion centers. 
the, 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 um, it's the data zone is the pilot interoperable data system for the children. It fed to the Silicon Valley uh, Regional Data Trust, and then that feeds to the National Interoperability Collaborative, which is partnered with the Co Council on Crime and, Ju and Delinquency and the Fusion Centers. And it's mostly health and human services data. So this is, I wish that this was not true, but this is like, we have to stop the internet bodies and we have to stop the, the EMF radiation telecom systems. Um, this is my friend Joseph, he's brilliant. I have a web webinar on my um, YouTube page. Uh, we did this last August. He is a uh, combat veteran um, and uh, a brilliant mathematician. He is great with, uh, he's done AI work, he's done blockchain work, he's done actuarial work, he's done gaming video game design. And he tells me pretty much like the, um, the video game design world is a revolving door with the military. It's military simulation, video game simulation, military. These people, they're all part of the same overall network. So he's building a, a video game of technocracy to try to illustrate to the kids like what this actually is going to look like in a way that is on their level. And to use his gifts because he's actually made tremendous sacrifices personally because he can't be a part of this anymore. So he's building his own game to try to educate and using his gifts. So this is one, I know you guys have autonomous vehicle pilots in Arizona, right? And so you've got the vehicle and they come up and like the ball runs out into the street and they're like, okay, well, who gets hit? Like, what is the outcome of this? And then there's real time things of like, okay, what, who, where does this autonomous car swerve? that is getting built into these algorithms, who's valued and who is not valued in this equation and taking that out. And that's a really r real thing that we need to think about. So again, this is, an, this is an infographic that I've done that talks about pay for success. You can see essentially austerity um, is the basis for all of it. If the government doesn't have access to resources, like theoretically, if we had a government that was accountable to people, right, that you could vote in and out, that that, that actually really worked, um, then, then you would, you would people would pay their taxes equally and they wouldn't have offshore banking and there would be money to take care of people who needed it and, and that sort of thing. But austerity is the precondition. They set up essentially outcomes-based government contracts. So these date back to the mid 90s with Arthur Rolnick and the Minneapolis Federal Reserve. Um, but those contracts are now going to, I think ultimately blend with the internet of bodies and Ethereum smart contracts. Okay, and it will all be framed as transparency, accountability. Don't you want your government to be more accountable? Don't you want them to do good? You know, and so it's like, do we want them to do really a really good job of brainwashing toddlers on the surveillance play tables? Like, what are those outcome sets? Like, that's that's what this looks like. And then, so they set a narrow metric, like the special education, you know, for the pre-K that they don't need it. The investors invest. Now, these investors, when we're talking about it, part of it is like our own complicity, right? I mean. These are the largest asset holders. There's something called the Impact Management Project. They're running not just the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund or the Vatican Bank or all of this, this other money, but then there's pension funds. Like if you have a pension, they're investing in stuff that will be these impact bonds. So it, like we're all woven into this web. Like we all have to untangle it. The investors invest and then they securitize the debt. Now the securitization is where the big shorting comes in. So imagine the scenario with the kid and the ball in the street and the augmented reality and the algorithmic measuring of whose life is worth what, and you add in global uh, hedge funds, shorting systems, right? Because you've got smart environments. So what if someone has taken out a program on your life that is, like they think, someone is investing that you succeed on your pathway of life improvement and someone is betting that you don't, right? And I sort of say, I have terrible luck with a bus. Like my family, they come up, the bus always comes like in five minutes. Like I show up, it's like, oh, it's on, you know, it's, it's redirected and we didn't bother to put up the sign and like I'm waiting for 45 minutes. And I, so imagine you're someone who's like put on a work, you know, welfare to work program and like you're going to be cut off of your UBI if you don't, you know, make it to this interview and get this job and you're waiting for the bus with your smart pass and the sensor senses that, oh, it's you waiting for the bus here? I'm going to send that bus around. Like so you, like the world can start to conspire for you or against you depending on like your positionality in it. And it starts to sound a bit like Black Mirror, but I don't know unless we start talking about the ethics of what we're building, like how it would not go there, like knowing like how the history of domination tends to go. So there's, there's a securitization. The other piece is this outcomes-based contract allows everyone to be under perpetual surveillance under so that we can be accountable to the government, right? Everybody, like we need to know what, where our money's going. So we need to watch you all the time, especially you poor people who might like rise up 
we can't have that. Everybody six feet apart, please. You know, like that's, <laughs> that's the thing. And so then they have, they add in the third party. So like, said, oh, well, just so you know, we're not ripping off the system. We've got this outside person looking in at us to like, let us know if, if, if this deal is right, if you really met the metrics. Well, Palantir, the pilot programs, I have a friend who's in Santa Clara County, California, which is where this is being piloted, which is like, we're started by Santa Clara University and Catholic Relief Services. And, and, and Newsom is an alum of that university and it's a social impact university. They're test bedding these for pre-K, for early literacy, for uh, mental health and for housing in Santa Clara as the test bed. Palantir was the data evaluator for the mental health and housing. So Palantir is involved in like predictive policing and border patrol and all sorts of other stuff. So like imagine you're somebody, you know, in Santa Clara County and you need housing and you're, so Palantir gets your data? You know, that's intense. That's a pretty intense thing. So no one's talking about this. So then the deal either gets paid and the shorting happens or it doesn't happen and it goes forward. So, so that, is, that is sort of this web of how this all works. So everything is reduced to an equation what they really want, which is disturbing. And again, this is one of these traps. I'm trying to show you the trap. Um, I came into this fighting standardized testing. And, and uh, you know, the high stakes testings were used to close our schools. Well, now you're hearing social emotional learning. You're right, it's not just about reading and math. You're right, we, we, we care about everything. We care about the whole child. We care about your whole child. We'd like to measure everything. Can we measure their art? Can we measure their gym? Can we measure their music? Can we measure, you know, we have these brainwave headbands now. We'd really like to measure the whole child. And so this is what's coming is, and they, people, you're, you're like, you're right. We do care about the whole child. Like, and then you don't know that it means brainwave headbands. Like no one's gonna tell you that till later. So um, this guy, Clive Belfield, at, he's at Teachers College, Columbia University. So he did the equation, like he's working with UNESCO and the global OECD people and to say well if we do a social emotional learning curriculum like we can prevent children from being juvenile delinquents or whatever it's gonna be great and so I actually went to the Dirksen Senate building several years ago when they were all they had seed money it's called the social impact partnerships pay for results act or CIPRA and it's totally bipartisan this is 100% like I saw it for myself that all of the keynote speakers were elected Republicans all of the panelists were Obama technocracy people and the whole room was full of like 200 nonprofits and like think tank leaders like it was like me and my friend were the only two regular people in the room and they were just like bring it on champagne and strawberries like we're, this is coming and but after the Q&A with the policy about these impact bonds um, there's a q and I'm always really pretty good at getting the first question so I go up and I go okay so I know that in Massachusetts they're talking about like middle school doing a social emotional curriculum so where do they stop getting tracked Right? Like, where do they stop? Because at kindergarten, that kindergarten, that pre-K one, they stopped at kindergarten. They would be like, oh, do you need special education or not? Okay, the deal is done, and now you, you may proceed. Clean the slate. What happens, like, it, so the, out, the cost offsets for the social emotional were addiction and depression and incarceration. So say you get swept into a, a, you know, a program in sixth grade because you filled out some survey that, that you're gonna be a pre-crime person, and they bet on you, like what happens when you're 35 and the robot stole your job and you need therapy and there's some smart credit token that pops up, you know, oh, this kid got the, you know, and readjust, recalibrate the impact, you know, the investment market for the hedge funds because that's going to be the permanent record, right? And I would think how, at the time, I didn't fully have a handle on blockchain. I'm like, how are they going to, but I asked that to the, the, the panel and this is the woman from Goldman Sachs. This is like the head of, he was Obama's social impact guy, David Wilkinson. He's now in Connecticut running like, early childhood and health and human services. I'm like, how does this work? And they didn't really have a good answer. And then afterwards, I had four consultants run over with cards saying, I can make an equation for that. I can make. And like, they didn't understand that I thought it was horrific. Like no one could even imagine that there was somebody in the room who would be like, that's really bad. Like, did you ever do anything in middle school that you wouldn't want tracked for the rest of your life? For Goldman Sachs to make a buck? You know, it's terrible. So the other piece is like Ready Nation is a part of this. There's something called Council for a Strong America. And again, this is something where I think they whip sort of the national like elements. Like people want to feel patriotic. Council for a Strong America. Well, we're going to make sure that the children are aligned with the workforce. That's Ready Nation. With the police, with the military, um, with uh, athletics and with evangelical Christianity. And those were the five topics. And Ready Nation was the workforce alignment. That's what their speculation was going to be on. It's not backed by good people. Like you wouldn't, I would think if you're a person of faith, you wouldn't join up with someone who was aligning kids to be in line with the military and the police on all of these things. Um, 
And so they all went, Ready Nation, it was a global forum in New York City in 2018, and they rang the NASDAQ bell. And they put up these billboards saying, look, we're going to have, a, a, it's great to have so many private sector leaders gathered in New York to discuss the importance of early learning and workforce development. So when people say, like, how did this happen? And I'll be like, they told us. Like, they told us it was happening. They told us. And I didn't, this was pre-COVID, so I don't, you know, I didn't know how fast. I thought I had, like, seven to ten years, literally. It's going a lot faster. So social impact, uh, social finance is a key player in this. Um, Sir Ronald Cohen, he's in the UK. Um, you know, I think largely this is also a crown enterprise. Um, you know, I think when I talk about this digital video game and the digital twinning that they're going to do, in some ways it's this idea of the securitized straw man just coming out into the open as like an, a cartoon avatar, but like there's a synergy there and if you guys, I know some people are more, it's not my depth of knowledge, but in that movement, in that space, like understand the resonance there. Again, Cohen is very connected, his uh, former father-in-law, now deceased, he was the, the captain of the Exodus. So there's a lot of connections crown-wise between US, UK, Israel, tech, high-tech, biotech, nanotech. Um, they're doing stuff called career impact bonds, and they're doing it with the governor of New Jersey, former Goldman Sachs, nice Democrat, okay? So they're setting up for all the people dispossessed to have their jobs by lockdown. You can now do income sharing agreements, which means your future wages are garnished for your, to pay for your training. Not only your training, your social services while you're getting trained, like your childcare, um, to do coding, big pharma, or energy. So you can build the prison planet. Like your choice, if you're you know, someone who got pushed out of your work, you're a, you know, a waitress or something, is to help code the prison planet and be in under subject to these didn't like financial instruments. These career impact, Phil Murphy, this is already happening, this is coming. So you see ASU GSV, um, Michael Crow is very well connected with Global Silicon Valley. They've been running annual conferences co combining ed tech for a long time. Uh, this was a panel in 2018 about income sharing agreements which essentially said that they're going to securitize them. And that's exactly what I've said about the securitization market. They're gonna securitize this as education and training debt. They were talking about four-year college, but clearly it's not gonna be about four-year college because their goal is there won't be any college. There won't be anything but perpetual skill, credit, quest, task, Pokemon Go education. There will be no discrete, except for the super elite, maybe Yale, and you know, a couple of those things will make it through. But um, they're securitizing people. This is, you know, again, ties back to Arizona with ASU ZSV, they're talking about it. Um, there are a couple of, and I'm gonna share my slide deck after this. I would highly recommend looking at these two stories because they, they go into things that sound science fiction, but they're not. One is out of slate about shorting people's futures. And then when people don't perform to value, like hired assassins to like kill them off. And then the other one is the domestic front, and it's about um, a really depressed person, an autonomous vehicle has stolen their partner, and, they, and they're depressed in this smart house and like what it looks like. So this is from the first, the Slate article, but they're talking about um, the last paragraph. It was a highly liquid market at the top end that allowed for an entirely new asset of equities and derivatives. And the prodigies, these are students, prodigy asset groups were uh, particular risk levels and in industry clusters. And the average investor didn't even have to research the assets. They could bet on demand for a certain profession. It was a casino, but instead of betting on black or red, the vote was on whether a high school kid was going to be successful. And Sophia was good at making the bet. So they're already normalizing this. Um, this, is, this is a map that I did of the, uh, the ASU GSV panel. Uh, Edly is the platform they're gonna use to do the securitization of income sharing agreements. And no big surprise and why National Press is not covering this, the co-founder of the securitization platform, his name is Christopher Riccardi. He's the grandfather of collateralized debt obligations. <laughs> I mean, he, it's not, he's doing exactly the same thing that happened in the real estate all over again with training debt. And training debt is essentially your prison sentence because prison is no longer gonna be in a physical prison, it's going to be you in the digital panopticon on a pathway. So the other thing I wanna make really clear, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later because I know in the libertarian space and even in like the freedom space, there's a lot of, like people are still trying to figure out about blockchain and about crypto and about assets and my frame, because I came at this through digital identity, not through the money side. I was looking at it when they were talking about putting babies on blockchain and going as a mom, heck no, you don't put people on blockchain, right? And so there's this struggle because for the most part, people who are maybe feeling like that's a liberation are less likely to want to know about putting babies on blockchain, that maybe that's not such a good thing. But the other thing is these smart contracts, is that in this augmented reality that is going to be built with the QR codes, 
it's built on its contract. So for a long time, the lawyers and the accountants are gonna be doing really well for themselves until the robots take over their jobs because they're going to make the contracts. It'll be like, um, am I allowed to have the box lunch? Do the QR code and find out. It's like a giant, you know, can you get on the bus? Can you get that bird scooter thing? Can you open your refrigerator? Everything is dependent on if you have a token in your wallet that says you're allowed to do it. So your rights are mediated digitally in this way. So people who are focused on the Constitution and again, I would say like these folks realize that that was never written for them, but now I think it's not, it's, you will never get to that. There will be a layer of digital transactions that will never even keep you from getting down to a real human right, constitutional right. We will live in a state of exception run on digital contracts. So in this, this gentleman, it opens with he's, you know, had a tough night and he's negotiating with his toaster because he's depressed and he's asking his toaster to, um, you know, print uh, toast images of despots like definitely, like that's his, I don't know, and, and they're like, I just really want to do kittens, you know, is that okay? And it's all run on a smart contract. Like, they're like, well, it's, could you use a public domain? It would be cheaper. Like, and he's having these interactions with non-human entities. And that is, I mean, it's kind of grotesque, but that, that is what is, is being planned. And it's being implemented in, in ways that if you don't know the bigger picture or the, the power structure behind it, you, Anyway, so smart, yeah, so this is smart homes, yeah, this is the second bit. So the, the, the toaster had been provided by the Transhumana Wellness Group, so this is all health pathways. And if you have breakfast, it lowers your risk of heart disease. But, you know, it's talking about that he was drunk on the floor and, you know, peeing in his sink because he didn't want his smart toilet to narc on him. So, you know, that's, you know, that's, um, that's, that's what they're envisioning, right? But it's like your wellness, your wellness toaster would like to print you some kittens now on your toast. Is that okay? Is that okay? You know, that's, that's, and because you're alone, because you know the autonomous car has stolen your partner and you're, you're not allowed outside um, so it sounds but in reality so there's this other piece so this is from a paper from Israel now Israel is like very advanced like as the US and much of this and much of the tech space and they have social services so again in the UK like it, it's 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 injecting its top this digital toxin into existing social service systems which I can say probably never worked perfectly but like they that's flowing through the veins of that so so um, countries that have socialized healthcare systems um, are, are prime targets for having this be incubators so in this um, there's a whole webinar that I did with the state of Rhode Island about um, e-government solutions and using COVID to push everything online into digital government systems. Estonia is the model, but um, essentially Rhode Island was like, hey, sign me up, like we wanna be just like Israel. And they mentioned um, this thing called the rights engine. And again, it's framed as here are your wonderful benefits. Can't we tell you, depending on who you are, this lovely complement of benefits that we have to offer you, right? Like, oh, you're, you, you've reached this particular age, now you have access to these wonderful benefits. And they, it's always this dual use, right? They don't say, by the way, now your benefits, are, your government benefits are gonna be digitally mediated and tied to smart contracts and conditional probably on how you behave or how compliant you are to the program. Um, I mean, the other thing I will just say is also like, Israel is a, is a primary focus for transhumanism. So a lot of that technology and the nanotech and the biosensors interfaces with this overall transhumanist program. This is from a publication, this is 2010. This is 2010, right? I'm like, we're like 11, 12 years ago. Um, and it, it's called H plus. So they're talking about human plus. You know, it's, it's all framed as, um, augmentation, augmentation of the human, but without understanding that the, the thing in which that is being augmented is a militarized technology. So here I will say, like this is from the Attorney General, you guys have a FinTech incubator uh, that's doing all sorts of interesting digital currency programs now, and they're talking about doing income sharing agreements, right? Um, the FinTech sandbox. So this income sharing agreement thing, you should be on people's radar because it is here in Arizona. Um, I'm just going to bump back to Pavel Luksha. He was with the uh, Global Education Futures, the Hieronymus Bosch, um, you know, we, we want to have people nares and, and hive minds. He was connected at the time, like when I first saw him with world skills, world skills. And I didn't understand what the skill building was at the time. I guess world skills. Well, clearly because they need the new skills or to build the digital jail. Um, and so he was talking about using project-based learning and using the skills these income sharing agreements are gonna be hooked into wearable technology and virtual reality. And so your apprenticeship, like you could be an apprenticeship to like a drone manufacturer in your bedroom in an outfit and they'll rent you the outfit, right? Like that's how this thing is gonna go with the world skills. And what I didn't quite process at the time was that the data harvest off of you acting out 
the behaviors that they want you to act out is your training protocol because they're never going to give you the job or very few people are ever actually going to get the job. You have to perform as though you're being trained for the job. They're harvesting your biometrics and they're harvesting how you walk and how you think and how all of these things to feed the robots. Um, so like, and this is part of the workforce capital flows. So again, transitioning to the fourth industrial revolution from the knowledge economy to this next phase of globalization that's built on telepresence and platform labor with haptics. Um, so they talk about reframing and reimagining workforce developments as investments leading to scalable solutions and measurable outcomes. So everything has to be measurable. So whenever you see impact or measurable or even accountability or transparency, understand behind the scenes they're talking about data analytics and then underneath the data analytics is essentially um, coercive uh, surveillance technologies. So this is coming out of uh, the, the Federal Reserve System. Again, this is a crown <laughs> venture too, and um, they're the ones that are going to be doing this. There's a lot of connections to the University of UT Austin, and they had done a lot around like welfare reform. So we have to see this as this, again, this dependency, the Indian reservation, we have, we have dispossessed you, we have taken your practice, we have imposed our will on what we think you should be doing as a civilized entity, and then we will profit off of that system. Um, but this is Pavel Luksha's slide share. You know, people can look it up, but he's, he's pretty straight up saying, like, they're developing a neural roadmap towards transhumanism, and again, this is, 20, this is 2014. And they're talking about every aspect of life being affected, from your education, entertainment, healthcare, social, public art. All of this run, security and defense, urban living, all of it runs on the blockchain, and all of it is tied to your digital identity. And they're harvesting people into the machine. And so that's, I talked about the social emotional learning. So some of you, I don't know if people are familiar with Cardano and like Ava, the blockchain system. So um, uh, Hoskinson, they just signed up the largest digital identity program pilot for uh, students and teachers in Ethiopia. So they've got five million kids. Now it's not a health one. And like most people in the health space can't mesh the health passports to the education vouchers. They don't see the connection. They're like, oh, but I'm really concerned about vaccines. I'm really, con you know, I'm really concerned about health choice. They're, and don't talk to me about education right now. We have to talk about health stuff. I'm like, no, it's a structure. The structure is all, it's a through line. So in Cardano, they've actually said that they're doing workforce training to train the people to build the blockchain. Um, they're gonna train, they, the emphasis is on girls, particularly because, um, uh, girls are gender equity united nations sustainable development goal five project so and in my my sense is there's a darker element that if you i think i think they want the maternal feminine i think they want the sacred feminine in this if you are trying to re hijack into a new evolutionary trajectory of a silicon based world they need to eliminate biological you know they need to eliminate that piece so like women and particularly i think people cultures that are still connected more directly to their natural base they need to be eliminated first. So the Cardano's going in, they're gonna take over Africa, they're, they've set up online education systems with digital identities for those kids. They have partnered with OpenCog and Hanson Robotics. So that's Ben Gertzel, that's Sophia the Robot over there. Okay, they developed a lab in Ethiopia, they, I can't remember, it's the Sheba Valley maybe, this is Silicon Valley of Ethiopia of Africa, it's the tech center. They've actually brought in, and people might speculate, but they've said, like, they taught her, It's um, Herak, I think, the, Ethi the language of Ethiopia, they said Ethiopia is very special. And after English, they taught her um, Herak. Okay, so there's the whole Gnostic piece and Sophia, the robot, right? And um, they're going to, I think, feed the data, think of the headsets, into the robots. And it's pretty intense. And then beyond, underneath that is um, Nubian VR. That's another, you know, an African girl in Africa. UNICEF is partnering to get VR education in throughout, it's India, Africa, and also they have a pilot in Chile. And they're saying, um, it's just a disconnect. It's to disconnect you from the, 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 and I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. But behaviorism, the robots cannot learn all the things, right? They are not nearly as sophisticated. And don't be bummed out, because like, we're super powerful. We just don't know exactly what we're doing yet, but we'll get there. Like, but they can only think really narrowly, right? So everything has to be really behaviorist. So if the robots are gonna learn from us, they have to confine us. They have to confine us physically. They have to confine us mentally. Like the emoticon thing, how are you feeling? I don't know, let me give you these choices. And if I give you these choices, I can learn you, because that's a pattern. I can learn your pattern, but you can't you can't do a choice that's not on there. You can only do the choices I give you. Um, it's Skinnerism, like it's it's connected to the Skinnerist behavior, narrow um, 
programmed behaviors. In the Tea Party, this is the PBS Kids app because they're after the little kids and their behaviors. If you don't share your cookies right, the app knows. And it will prompt you. And it'll say, you need to share your cookies right. And that's connected to Heckman, the Heckman equation. And essentially, he was saying they're talking about these PBS Kids apps. In this is on YouTube at the University of Chicago's like human capital economic opportunity group on social emotional learning and he's invited all of these esteemed researchers into the room and they're saying well we can't get the parents to make the kids play the apps it's like a two-part app like it tracks the parents and it tracks kids because it's always double we can't get the parents to make the kids they say they're going to do it and then they never do I don't know the guy's like I don't know what to do and then Heckman you know he's like hmm well you know you're acting like the parents are experts and they're not experts they're not experts at all you just need a, you need to gamify it for them you need it like a game I, but it has to have a good incentive a good incentive like hmm, pornography yeah that's a good incentive and you can see all the people's like heads in the room just like in this like oak paneled rooms and, and they're like did he just say that you know he's like a seven-year-old like one old prize winning economist like he did he's like well no just kind of kidding about that but I mean a good incentive right and so I went to an event like with they were trying to capture all of our nonprofit media with the community relations of our NPR station and I said hey listen I just watched this thing this is really bad like you guys have to get a handle on these apps and tracking kids behaviors and she just looked at me and she said well what do you want me to do about it we all take the money so I built my career on Ford Foundation grants and so I'm like well I didn't take the money <laughs> I think this is pretty terrible you know like I'm, we're, we shouldn't be doing this like we shouldn't be doing this and if your NPR station is going to do that to kids. Like, I'm going to talk to whoever else is willing to put them, their bodies between them and their kids to stop this from happening. So, and they say, who's the they? Who's the they? Well, I always say, impact management project, that's a good start because it's about money and power. But then there's functionaries, right? There are people who are groomed up to do this. So this is a woman I just found. Um, I have a friend who's brilliant. I highly recommend. There's a blog called A Piece of Mindful. Um, it's, a, it's a collective blog, and she, she blogs under the pen name Steffers, like, Stephanie, but just Steffers. And she has a bunch on nanotechnology that are really brilliant. And she's like, Allison, I have this 900 page book on transhumanism. And I go, she calls me, and I'm like, well, do they think it's bad? And they're like, no, they think it's good. <laughs> she's, she's like wading through this book. And one of them, she gave me this paper, she sent this paper to me. She's like, yep, there's a whole section on blockchain and transhumanism. I'm like, okay. You know, I wish, like, I wish anyone who's out there pushing crypto would actually read the hive mind blockchain part first before they like go all in because that would be helpful. But this woman wrote the paper on crypto mines, essentially talking about using tokens to engage in like collective consciousness with machines. It's really intense, like collective consciousness with other people and machines. And I think like these Facebook rooms and things are pre like predecessors to this space. But who could even conceptualize that someone would think that you would do such a thing? But like she's coming out of, you know, telecom and you know she's teaching at singularity university and the lifeboat foundation luxes with the lifeboat foundation like there are real people who are pursuing this in pretty intense ways now again let's just hope that our collective um, transmutation against that will will stop it in its tracks but these people are out there um, again 2008 uh, the institute of creative technologies which is at uc uh, usc it's essentially Hollywood meets the army. It's funded by the army military lab and one of the high execs of Disney and they came together to develop synthetic people. So they're like, you know, we like simulations. You like simulations. Let's get together and put our best heads together on what we can simulate, right? And now we, we're ending up with metahumans, which is, you know, hey, we can have a Star Wars movie and put a dead person in it because we've captured them and like reinserted. We can blur the line between life and real. So digital twins, they're going to do this on blockchain through electronic health record. That starts the armature of the twinning process. Um, electronic health records, uh, Zeke Emanuel at Penn, getting the American Affordable Care Act in place with the electronic health records. That's, it's coming both through blockchain education, uh, medical passporting, also electronic health records. Eventually, it'll all merge. Uh, in Japan, they're looking at doing um, their goal. This is the government of Japan, Science and Technology Agency, in December 2019 is saying that they are anticipating a future of where we use remote avatars and robots and 3D images as proxies, and it is empowering. It's all in the disability rights community. They're saying like, hey, isn't it great? Like, we should now all just live through avatars, and it will be equal, and it will be like diverse, and we will all be like that that's, and, and it's important to know that that's Nippon Telegraph and Telephone, and then that is um, also SoftBank that is running the largest AI innovation fund. 
So, and again, you guys are familiar with the software of life, but again, they're, they're looking to turn this into a planetary computer. Um, you know, look up the internet of bio nano things, like things I never wanted to learn about, but it really is, they're talking about that the, there will be interfaces between the electrical domain of the internet and the biochemical domain of internet of bio nano things networks, the ultimate frontier, seamless interconnections the cyber world and the biological world. And this guy, Ian Achilles at Georgia Tech, and like, again, Georgia Tech is a highly militarized, just like um, Arizona State um, University. So yeah, we, the mad scientists are out there, and this is, this is the future that they're doing. Oh, so this is, again, this is just another clip from the same talk. The human beings that are arriving to us now, they're not the same species as you. They're homo sapien sapien dot net. I mean this in all seriousness. They are not the same species as you. They have never lived without access to some kind of a virtual supercomputer attached to their body. We have to figure out what that homo sapiens sapien dot net is. How does that person learn? How can that person be influenced? How can you communicate with that person? And so the conflicts of the future are all going to have to then realize that there is a huge transformation in human evolution. <laughs> I mean, let's they tell you, it's on YouTube. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not, I don't, I don't. So they call this Centaurs, the human uh, interface. This is from a DARPA, a woman who was formerly a DARPA, now it's something called Platypus. They're saying they want to combine, like, the pattern recognition of AI with the, you know, empathy of humans or whatever. And it's, and it's really interesting. So this, I'm in Philly. Um, there's something mystical that is arising here. Like, I don't think that the, this, that, I have a friend and he's developed a website called Silicon Icarus that's a compilation of a lot of writings and I think it is like Icarus, this idea that they have these aspirations, the Silicon Valley, that they are going to soar to you know, the, the sun and the things that the, it's going to melt, you know, that wax is going to melt off but we have to have the fortitude to get to that point. Um, but there's sort of this mystical experience and Philadelphia has this interesting history of both like Freemasonry and power and all sorts of things and in the 1690s these monks came from the old world, from Germany and Silesia. Um, it was Jakob Zimmermann and uh, Johannes Kelpius. And they were, they, were, they were a millenary in cult. They thought it was the end of the world. And they said that they were supposed to go to Pennsylvania and wait for the woman in the wilderness. And so they brought 40 men, monks, and they built a, 40, like, uh, a school and an observatory. And they were astronomers and astrologers and mystics and alchemists. And um, you know, they had their faith. They had the, one of the first hymnals in the new world they developed. And so again, vibration, vibrational things. And it didn't, it didn't happen, but there's a, um, a space, it's probably really just a spring house, but they call it the Kelpius Cave in the park, in, in the city. And the Rosicrucians have a monument to him outside of it. And they're like, he's the first Rosicrucian in North America, right? And so this monument on the side of it, it just has, you know, it was put up in the 60s, I think. It's, you know, it's maybe 10 inches wide there. It says Nephili on the side in Greek. Now, I would not know Greek. Like, my husband with me goes, oh, that's Greek. Let's, that says Nephili. I'm like, who came out and wrote that on that marker out there? Who did that, right? And so, so Nephili was the cloud nymph in the Greek mythology. So Ixion, I think, was like the first murderer in like the mythology, was lusting after Zeus's wife Hera. So he recreated Nephili, who was a cloud nymph, to, uh, as a twin of her. And then she was raped, and then from that came the centaurs. And now they're saying, we don't call them cyborgs. Cyborgs isn't such a good word. We should call them centaurs, right? And then later, like, there was some other, like, remarriage and other children after a famine. Um, like, the, the ram that became the golden fleece, like, saved them. But there was a, a crop famine, too. So these, there are these elements of, like, clouds and violence and twinning and the centaur piece. Like, there are these things. And so who, who you know, and I, at first I thought, is it chalk? Because it's very carefully done, but hand done. And it's paint. I've gone back again. It's still there. But... The NIH has started an initiative to study the microbiome. And they specifically say they're, they're, big, they're calling it Nephili. Now Penn is a center, and actually, you should look up Roz Ben's work. It's really interesting. He's a geomancy guy in Philadelphia, R-A-S-B space B-E-N. And he does a lot of historical research, sort of esoteric knowledge on Philadelphia. And like it's his premise like that is told through the public art of Philadelphia that Ben Franklin and Prometheus opened the gates of hell in Philadelphia. <laughs> and, and you know, Penn is Ben Franklin's university. So I'm like, I don't know. Penn started impact investing. Penn is doing this biotech CRISPR research. Penn is doing a lot. ENIAC, the first computer, like big mainframe. Like there's a lot going on at pen like let me tell you so anyway so I just sort of want to draw that connection and I think that's sort of the, the last 
bit. The next, tomorrow when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about the game. And you know what, let's close with Michael Crow. Let's run this last one. We have 150 partnerships. We've built a learning platform that's unparalleled. We launched a program in August just to offer a few courses to some folks. On a global basis, we had 192 countries respond. Over 120,000 learners for the first couple courses that we put out. We had 12-year-olds in Peru complete college astronomy courses for credit. I don't know what that means. It means something. We've got about, I had a meeting yesterday with um, Bill Gates in, in San Diego as a part of the ASU GSV uh, Innovation Conference on Educational Technology that we had 3,600 people attend uh, yesterday. And, and I was walking through uh, with uh, Mr. Gates the uh, fourth realm that we're presently operating in, which is education through exploration through game-based learning. We're just imagine this at the end of the game, and we, we're building this game. At the end of the game, you don't take a single test. You don't take a single course. You don't have a single lecturer. And at the end of the game that you play, you'll be able to pass any college entrance exam, or what we call Cambridge A-level exams. Anyone that completes the game, boy, girl, doesn't make any difference, any A-level exam in math, chemistry, physics, or biology, period. What does that mean for learning? So, yeah, so I'll just close there. Oh, oh. So, um, so just in closing, I, I don't have all of the economic answers. I, I do want to say I have grave concerns about blockchain as liberation. And last summer I had the gift of spending some time on, a, on Lakota land in South Dakota. And I actually, I, I saw for myself the gift economy, like people who on, on the books probably economically are the most disenfranchised of, of anyone and the generosity that was, was given to me and um, including some fabric with ast ast astronomy because they're the star people. Mm -hmm. And it was quite amazing. And so um, I wanna just advance the gift economy a tiny bit today. So I have, it's like a gifted gift, a friend, I, this, my whole dandelion project, I wanted to create something that were like conversation starters that were outside of COVID because I feel like right now we have to get out of their game and they want us to keep talking about that. It's about all bigger things. And so we, we, I had these slogans that would say um, like dandelion manifest like manifesting don't geofence me in nature not nano and the revolution will not be tokenized meaning blockchain tokens and so um, a, a lovely woman who lives on Lake Onondaga and I'm gonna go up and actually speak with um, do a presentation with Andrew Kaufman and Tom Cowan um, in July um, and so I'm staying with her and she's an artist so she made this artwork and designed this for me and I put it on fabric and so I'm just gonna circulate. I, like ultimately, I wanted to sew in public and turn these into buttons. Like I didn't just wanna buy buttons. It didn't feel right, like it was actually. And so I, like, I can't give you anything more than the patch. But even if you just put it on a safety pin, like it's a conversation starter. And I think the energetic point of this is that it's coming from a place that is, um, has light, has love and light. And I'm not saying that, but I think really energetically, um, Michael Bloomberg, he built his European headquarters. He's gonna run the global prison planet for Bill Gates, by the way, like on the Mithric, the temple, the Rowan ruins of this Mithric temple. That didn't happen by, so we've, we've got to do like the dandelion power. So thank you for your attention today. I look forward to continuing tomorrow. <laughs>
would be applied over the world and the humanity of the world and people would lose their agency to this mechanical system. You know, I just want to reinforce a lot of my context yesterday was in considering what happened with the conquering of this continent by European settlers. And in many ways, that too was an overlayment of a new uh, economic order, a new order of faith and practice that then largely, you know, tried to, you know, excise the existing order. And so I think these, these dynamics of domination sort of run through our histories and it's important to, to consider that. So I just want to start with this, this intention that I had said that my friend shared with me about the children, just that we're starting in the right place, um, that children's growth is guided by love and that thirst for power and control have no jurisdiction here. Because I would say the reality is, is that most of us who are here in this room are pretty disposable to the system. They're probably not planning on trying to rope us in. We are, we are, will be jettisoned as soon as they find convenient. But what they really want are the, the children and the not yet born to have that normalization, right? To know that there's no difference than, you know, sitting up and down at this, the ring of the tone, right. you know, in that doctor's office. They want them to always think it's always been that you stand up when the tone happens. And so it's our position to be able to to stop that. So just hitting on a couple of slides from yesterday just to reinforce, I feel like personally my worldview is that we're at this crossroads of natural life or a synthetic life that is digital and militarized and looking at one's connection to sacred places and nature versus a, a military video game. Um, and so gamification is the theme of the day today. Um, this is from the Global Education Futures Forum, this era of gaming that you can see below. Games become everyday format of life. And so it's very important to understand that the gaming, the gamification and game theory are a central element of both um, role-playing defense and role-playing financial markets. Okay, so signals intelligence feed both of those things. And the gamification is part of that scenario planning process. And so by putting us in their game, um, it is putting us um, in a game that is not our own and we, we lose, lose our own agency. And so as I, just to reemphasize yesterday, I spoke about this new financial structure of human capital finance. It's also looking to, to financialize all of natural life. So my focus has been largely on managing people, um, but it's in relation to the environment and that is where Agenda 21 and the Extinction Rebellion, the corporate capture of the environmental movement moves in is that they want to manage us in relation to the world's resources. And so that they, they say they will protect us from the world's resources because we might get sick from them. They'll protect the resources from us because we might hurt nature. And that is the, how they will keep us apart. And, and the World Bank's One Health um, and program is a part of that. But we have to understand that the two pieces of these it runs on the sustainable development goals. And so one piece is largely about managing people and one is about managing neighbor, uh, uh, nature and they're in relation to one another. And um, Corey Morningstar, she's a contributor to Wrong Kind of Green and she really does a lot on the environmental angle, the corporate capture of the environment. Um, so it's based on pay for success finance, really this idea of outcomes based contracts which are being sold to us as accountability and transparency. But it's accountability and transparency to an industrial engineered machine that seeks to eat our souls, really. And so this idea of you, that you have, you predictively profile people, and the scientists, I think I would say, we need to understand them beyond the white coat lab scientists, but also the data analysts. The scientism religion also is, is, is largely run on big data analytics. And so even beyond the, the white coat doctors and the health professionals, that the new, the data analysts will potentially supersede that in the religion of scientism that is proceeding. So we will predictably profile people as a debt commodity, a debt on society based on genomics, geography, parent situation. We will say that we will fix them with an evidence-based solution. Uh, we will get investors to invest in that solution and then we will track people. And so this system enacts overall surveillance and then we will involve third parties to look at the data oftentimes with defense or state intelligence ties and then hedge funds can short the debt and either bet on how we do in the game right and then the game begins again and so people who have issues with everything can fall under this rubric it's a um, chronic illness uh, uh, food access, education, housing issues, mental health issues, all of these things are embedded into this machine to be gamified as social engineering as Patrick has stated in his earlier talk. 
So the name of the game. And Alana, it's, it's funny, I forgot that that was in part of your book, but my friend Joseph, again, who's, he's a combat veteran, he's like, yes, the game is full spectrum dominance. So it is, it is full spectrum dominance. And, and I had actually put that up before I remembered that, you know, just to reinforce in Alana's book, that is her focus. It is the full spectrum. And it goes from space to the microbiome so that you know she, she spoke about frequency right but the end the other full fullness of it is from space because a lot of this game will be run on satellite communications and then down to the microbiome and both of those spaces are spaces that the state of arizona is actively engaged with okay and so i think it's important i try to provide local context to this so that's the spectrum of domination. Again, I spoke yesterday um, quite often about Michael Crow, the president of um, Arizona State University and his ties. He, he's the founding board chair of InQtel, which is the venture capital arm of the CIA. And you know, you see there George Tenet is, is on the, the advisor group of that, that as well. Mm -hmm. So what, what is InQtel investing in? Yesterday I mentioned Pokemon Go, uh, Niantic, which developed Pokemon Go. But there, this is one of just about eight pages of open investments they have, and if you, if you look, it's, it's uh, trusted infrastructure, digital intelligence, autonomous systems. It's, you, you see lots of autonomous, uh, lots of trusted. That trust isn't human-based trust, that is mechanical trust. That is systems engineering, that is an industrial engineer, it's a social infrastructure that is actually essentially being underwritten by state intelligence, working in collaboration with this global finance system. So um, again, this is, this is local, so uh, University of Arizona here. They have the, the, the business school, a program called Insight, which they say it's the Center for Business Intelligence and Analytics, so big data research um, of all sorts. And they have all sorts of things around healthcare data and other sorts of data intelligence. But you can look, I, over there I put their sponsors. And their sponsors sort of say a lot as to the kind of work that, that's involved. I mean, the, the CIA is a sponsor of this business intelligence and Raytheon and SAP and Oracle. Um, and Amazon. So if, if we're talking about the, the systems engineering, it is fundamentally a military space. And when we think about the, the concept of domination, most people, average everyday people, even people with a graduate degrees or you know, who have credentials, are not aware that the structure is being put in place and what the relationships are. Even though if you go to look, it's pretty obvious. They, they, you know, they put it right on their web pages who, where their money is coming from. But these are the people who want to know the analytics. I also will point out um, NASA on there, so that's the space. So this, uh, yesterday I talked a little bit about mixed reality, augmented reality, where you use the geolocation data, um, you know, Operation Keyhole, Google, you know, it, it's really convenient to have a map that knows where you are and can tell you what to do and what restaurants to go to, but ultimately that's based on real-time tracking of you within space. And then the overlayment of information through sensor networks onto the space. And I had mentioned about Niantic again being funded, through InQtel slash CIA, and they're developing things called augmented cities, where they're, um, it's all fun, right? They start out with the fun things, like the Pokemon Go games, isn't this entertaining, catch a monster. Here, we're gonna do local history. We'll put it in all your public parks, so you can scan your phone and you can hear interpretation. Um, but it's gonna be so convenient when no one is allowed to walk closer than six feet to anyone else, right? Here, we'll have your own pop-up art performance, right? You can interact digitally with a fountain on your phone. And it's, these are the augmenting that they're talking about, but it's starting off in a slow, soft version. Like, that. it's like, well, who could be against having a poetry tour downtown? You know, like, and then you say, but it's the CIA, and like, they don't believe you. So, so this is, and the other piece of this, so you can see there's um, Magic Leap, and I think, so if you, Someone recommended to me to read Neil Stevenson's book, The Diamond Age, and it was written in 1995, and it pretty much has all of this embedded, all of this technology, nanobots, one world government, uh, uh, tutors on iPads, um, you know, all, uh, digital governments and, and automated court systems and incarceration systems. Um, and he became, he worked for Jeff Bezos for a while, and then he became the head futurist at Magic Leap Virtual Reality. So that is sort of, you can see they're working on miniaturizing it smaller and smaller. Like you can wear your laptop in your headset. And so a lot of times what we're going to hear about uh, moving forward is middle, middle skills jobs, reskilling people for the new economy, the future of work. And it's all, my sense is that a lot of these programs, people are thinking, oh, we're talking about traditional, like, um, career technical education, vocational education, like you're going to go somewhere and someone, a person is going to teach you. And no, what they're imagining is virtual reality apprenticeships that are handled through these mixed reality uh, laptops. And if you imagine that as programming, like, 
you know, the individuals who are partners with these data analytics firms or other firms are programming the content that you receive through that headset and how you see the world, you're essentially forsaking the agency of you seeing the world with your own eyes, with the eyes of the intelligence community. So what is this purpose? Um, in my feeling is that this is foundationally about eugenics, but in, in many respects, if we imagine eugenics, um, you know, as you know, in the past of like, how can we create the perfect human, right? The strong, you know, intellectual. Um, this world is for post-human. They don't want the strong, critical thinking people as, they don't want those people around. Actually, what they pretty much want is a commodity they can manage through chronic illness and mental health, and um, that is under their control. Um, so that they can have them as a dependency to run these pay-for-success deals and make them code this virtual world. Is that in my opinion? And if you look back and, you know, it was sort of devastating to me, but when I was looking at the first social entrepreneurs um, in this Michael Young, and he's in the UK. So again, I had mentioned a lot of this is coming through the socialized systems, not that people don't need supports, especially if they're all going to be kicked out of their jobs, but that the, the engineered society, this guy Michael Young was the thought leader for, um, uh, the Labor Party post-World War II. And so he was involved in creating the NHS and he was connected to the London School of Economics and the Fabian Society. And those individuals were very much eugenics and emphasis, you know, and I didn't know that they even existed. I didn't even know to know about the Fabian Society. Um, and I had some, someone who leans left, I mean, honestly. And so when I found this, this thread that distance learning, you know, state health systems, all of these things, and you match it, I didn't know about the, the background of the Rockefeller medicine allopathic. Like, I'm new to a lot of this. So it made a lot of sense to me that you, you, you create a system, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, that pur pur purports to care for you. And then when you give yourself over to them, it's not that at all. So I think I might have mentioned this yesterday about the Japan, oh, I used a different slide, the Japan Science and Technology Agency. This is their uh, moonshot project. And again, we have to understand that as coming through both um, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone and SoftBank, which is the largest uh, disruptive AI and robotics fund. They're channeling out a lot of the Saudi sovereign wealth fund money. So when we talk about like diversity, equity, inclusion, um, as much as, you know, Clearly, we want to have vital, vibrant places with lots of people. What they're actually laying the groundwork for here is cybernetics and to create the status of robots or hype human hybrids as a diversity issue. So you can see that what they're aiming for is augmented creatures, which also beyond human include animal plants and other beings and artificial ones, artificial creatures within physical cyber environments. And so like when I sit here and like I bring this piece of driftwood from the river, like I'm saying this is serious because we as humans have a responsibility because it is our fellow humans that are enacting this on the world. Like the moss doesn't have a say, like the cacti don't have a say if, about this geoengineering. And so it's really up to us to, to interrogate the system. And a lot of it's been being framed also within the disability rights movement. So they're, they're in, in Tokyo, they've been piloting remote operated ro robotics. So they'll say, oh, you're in the hospital bed, you have ALS, you, you can't, you're, you're mostly you know, people with significant impairment, uh, but you can work in a cafe through a robot, right? And if you imagine, like they frame it as, isn't it lovely to be social out in the world in that way? And yes, like clearly having some, like there are, there are real limitations, but it's this dual use, right? Are they gonna make the person pay off their time in a hospital by working in this cafe? Like, is it a really a caring thing that you're trying to enrich someone's life or is it another way of slave labor? And so these, these policies are moving forward. So I would just say gamification is central. Kevin Wehrbach, I might have mentioned him before, he's a professor at Wharton and he, he blends both gamification and blockchain and what Wehrbach has said to his group of Wharton alumni because he said, you know, a lot of people don't even know that there's a game and a lot of people don't know the rules and sometimes the rules are unexpected. Um, so really it's best to be the one that designs the game, right? And so that, like if you're a Wharton alum, then you get to be in the room where Kevin Wehrbach says, you want to design the game, folks. You want to be the designer. And so you can see here, we're talking the behavioral analytics is leading to transhumanism. And I spoke yesterday a bit about using the data analytics to train the machines to be more human, right? So they're, they're linking the analytics into the uh, transhumanist program. And I sort of liken it like uh, one of the big players in this is actually Epic Games. 
Epic Games was able to scale Fortnite with money from Tencent in, in China. Tencent is a major uh, investor in the video game world, the virtual world. And it's sort of like the next iteration of the, the pick your own adventure books. <laughs> you know, like there's different quests and different tasks and you can come to different outcomes depending on at different forks in the road, the choices that are made or the outcomes. Uh, but ultimately it wasn't your book. Like you didn't write that book, you're in somebody else's book, you're in somebody else's game. And so if we accede to living in a world that is gamified, we're living in somebody else's game and they know the rules and we don't. Um, so I will just share this image like I encourage people especially if you care about nature and the environmental movement because so much of it has been captured through corporate interests. Uh, this is the internet of bio nano things and this this image from Ian Achildes, um, he's at Georgia Tech, I mentioned him yesterday. This, this has been in, in the process for the last like 15 or 20 years. Now I'm not in the tech space so I don't know if these are people who are blowing hot air, you know, that this is far from happening or not, the, clearly Georgia Tech is a major defense contracting research institution. Um, but the, these powerful people who are using our tax dollars <laughs> largely to do this research are imagining a cyber physical environment with uh, nanobots and voice to skull technology in which we interface with our world through electrical signals intelligence, right? And, and, and it's very true, you know, I'm still learning a lot of these things that we may, I mean, we're clearly electrical beings living in an electrical world and we're already in, engaging in electrical ways. Like we know that like the good feelings we feel when we're all here together and we're kind of on the same page, it feels good and there's an electrical element to that. But what does that mean that what they are building with their nanotechnology that Alana spoke to yesterday so clearly? Um, so. Yeah, so I just, I just sort of visual when I was looking for, like I feel like what they want to do is create husks of people, right? And then, and then like gut us out and make their machines. And so just when I, I happened to be looking for virtual reality and different things in Arizona and the zombie game came up, you know, Arizona Spring. So I don't, I'm not a gamer. I don't know if this is a good game or not, but like it's a pretty great, it had an adult rating on it. So I sort of feel like we're against the Arizona Spring zombie apocalypse version versus like someone who's actually fighting for like a sacred, like a cultural connection to place and community. So that's, that's sort of the game. So what is the board? So smart cities, I mean, that's something that Patrick knows very much about. Um, you know, and a lot of they're being run through space, running through these nanotechnologies. Essentially this idea, and we've heard in Nevada that they're talking about creating new cities now that are run by companies. Um, like company towns, right, coal towns, if you imagine the mining towns that are now the mining is they're mining your body, right, and it's the tech companies that are setting them up, um, that the world, virtual world, the gamified world is the game board, and then really, literally, the pieces in this game are our bodies from our, our, both our cells and our frequencies. So, you know, I really, like, I, I think I mentioned yesterday that I wanted to try to get out to that Vatican telescope. But I feel like it is, it is the sacred and profane engagement, right? And is a, it is a scientism, again, when, you know, and that's the interesting thing about this Vatican telescope. Why is it the Vatican and Arizona State University so interested in space? You know, is it just for, for you know, is it, it's, is it a faith thing or is it something else? You know, because we know that this game is going to be run, run from space. Um, so this is, this is a, an image from my friend Joseph's. Um, game that he's working on and actually it's interesting because it reminded me a little bit of Salt Lake City the mountains or here I guess a little bit um, and so he's he's building it and so if you imagine the world being recreated as a game and actually there's a lot of work to be done all of those tabs all of those numbers there's all sorts of math and then you code you know how people interact and how vehicles interact and what the behaviors are it's coding it literally is social engineering but you're socially engineering a game in which X amount of stuff is fixed according to code and then you enter real people who sign in and log in and play in this space. So this is sort of like transmuting a real landscape into this space that is, is not under our control. Again, the spatial web, this just talks about, if you look at the spatial web foundation, I put this up here, it's worth looking at the report. Again, I do not know how close they are in this technology, but you can see in the lower version, um, uh, the augmented reality, right? Someone walking and this pop-up. It's not unlike Minority Report. Like we've seen that when the guy walks through the mall and the messages pop up to him that are personalized to him. Um, 
they're talking about hyperporting of users and smart assets between spaces. And so my understanding, again, I'm not a gamer, but that you can get to different parts of the game by like clicking through. You can port into different parts of the game, different quests, different elements. So really what we're looking at, like when you see on your social media, like little rooms, like do you want to create a room with someone? Like that's a portal, like you're hyper, like they're normalizing all of this, like you will hyper port into this room. And I mentioned yesterday about the blockchain transhumanist brains, like something in that room might not even be a human it might be like the kitten kitten printing toaster you know in there that you're connecting to in your room to solve a global problem of climate crisis or something like that um, so I want to say that the world is going to be mediated by contracts I need people who are in the legal space or the accounting space to understand what they're building because they're not going to need you to either when they get there Okay, and it's gonna start small. It's gonna start like, okay, here's a signature for a smart contract, right? So this is, this is the starting point. We as a state have acknowledged the smart contracts, but look, it's, on a, it's a signature. And who's gonna say, well, that's a bad idea? Right, because we're all locked in now. How, you can't go to the thing, like you have to sign something. What, well, sure, we need a smart contract. Well, let's get those smart contracts on, quick, 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 you know? And it's interesting because when I went to Salt Lake City, one of the major anchor tenants in Silicon Slopes is Adobe. So I'm still trying to figure out if anybody has ideas about where Adobe plays in this, but I think it's gonna have something to do with these documents and smart contracts and midi midi uh, navigating the virtual web. But if anybody afterwards has some, I'd like to know there's something going on with Adobe in this. Um, but it's, it's mediated by QR code. So up at the top is a lock system that's a QR code mediated lock access point. And all you have to do is imagine all the things you engage with on a daily basis having a lock on them and then having a contract decide, depending on your level of access, whether or not you're able to engage with that material. So again, um, smart cities are the center. I know many people have done far depth, deeper research into to that program, that agenda, you know, as well as Rosa Corey, who has recently passed, which is very sad, just in her honor, acknowledging her work in that space too. Um, if we understand smart cities as following in the tradition of reservation systems, you know, where we, we put displaced people that we were inconveniently located in things that were places that we wanted to have access to. Um, I think that is the model. And like, I never knew, like, this is just floating out, like, this is not hard to find about, you know, the, the mad scientist megacity map. Like, th this is from 2012, right? So they know that they're going to put you in megacities. Like, we're not asking to all be in a megacity. I mean, I like my city. I'm not an anti-city person. Some people are like, oh, I'm definitely not a city person. But at the same time, the, the people in the cities aren't asking to be part of a mega region either. And this is, in, this, in one of these documents about the megacities, they said they're going to have uh, like mile-long corridors of orchards and parks so that they can mobilize the military between the giant sections of the mega regions. Like they're gonna keep clear, like cleared areas that aren't built up so that they can move their forces. That's pretty scary. And they talk about asymmetrical warfare. So what they talk about is they talk about warfare in an urban zone, which is really intense and challenging. And that is not unlike Cochise and Geronimo, like in the mountains there, that was asymmetrical warfare. So this is, they're learning those lessons and then they're applying them to the smart city regions. So I mentioned yesterday James Giordano, who's a professor at Georgetown. He's talking about neural weapons, right, accessing people's minds. And we had talked previously about accessing the blood-brain barrier and nanotechnology. Um, so they're talking about accessing neural systems to protect the polis, right? So if you are a threat to the smart city, you, are, you, are, you, you could become a target of a neurotech weapon. And that is the framing, and I think that is really important to understand is that, you know, and how we should do it remains an issue. So they're sort of touting that there's an ethical element of this, but don't think that they haven't already game played the scenarios here. Um, and again, you know, you guys, you guys got Gates setting up his smart city, right? So, you know, we, we, it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. So again, I mentioned the Internet of Bodies. This is, I actually, I ended up weirdly about four years ago in an angel investor meeting that I did not know about. It was an Evite on, I had like in my Google alerts, I still have Google alerts. It was like Internet of Things, Smart Cities, and Pay for Success. And it was a, it was a meetup at a, a, a co-working space in Washington that was connected to um, Microsoft and the IMF. And it was about all of those things. And the gentleman that ran this company was there, the Smart Internet of Things School. 
And it turned out it was a box lunch. There were only 12 people. Like, I thought it was a big auditorium of people, and I was there with three other people who were, I mean, clearly I was not an investor. And I called them out, and I said, this is not okay. And this guy, he said, like, he, he ran some big network in uh, uh, Richmond, Virginia, and he said that he took his daughter's history class online because she didn't like history. And I said, you know, now they'd know from behavioral biometrics it wasn't her, right? And he just looked at me. But they know what they're doing. They know what they're building. This was three or four years ago. So they're going to smart up your kid's school in every aspect, getting to them to and fro and what it is until they disappear the schools and they do it all to your house. Um, this is the house. This is Casita. This is a model. If you've noticed, I don't know, in Philly, we have all sorts of pop-ups now. Pop-up your, you know, things and pop-up parks and pop-up. They often use these cargo containers. Sorry. And um, so these cargo containers are sold. There's a video. It's like mid-century modern luxury, right? Like, look, you can pull out your bed. You can pull out your TV. You can do. And essentially, but they're like, yeah, here's 60 Internet of Things, things that are embedded in your casita. And they're selling them as like in-law suites. Oh, it's so cool. You can have your, your mom in the bed. So that, but they said, we're going to roll these things off like cars because it's all prefab. So we need to keep an eye, a very close eye on manufactured housing industry because how are they going to build the mega cities? It's going to be printing off-site, trucked, and then installed rapidly. And even in Philadelphia, a lot of the gentrification is happening um, with prefab housing in part, but it's not to this point. And you, you can see this, that is actually from their logo. They stack and pack. When we talk stack and pack, they are literally developing infrastructures to stack and pack those things. Because you're not getting out of them. <laughs> like once they put you in there, you're, I mean, you're on the third floor, you think you're getting going down? No, the QR code is not letting you down very often. You're in the zoo. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not, I don't want this to happen, but people need to know that these things, all of these pieces are rolling, right? So how do you get to move? How do you get to move? Well, that's the social credit. That's the geofencing from the satellites. You'll hear a lot of discussion now about mobility solutions. And again, a lot of it is time to climb it, right? Like we can't have our own cars. Now listen, I like to take the bus. I, I, like to, like, I, I like to ride my bike. I like to do these things, right? Do I want to have my mobility solution limited because Uber took, up the pub, took over the public transit system and now if I don't have a medically compliant QR code, I'm not going to be able to access any of their solutions? No, I don't want that. I want the city that I came to, which is a city with services, even though they were rather inadequate, that are under the control of the people, not private investors. So the MyPass project is really important to know about. I wrote about this last April, and I'm really hoping that the medical you know, freedom, the health choice community understands the breadth. So the medical passporting system, the biometric system, is meant to, for this much larger program to track you as a player in the smart city. That is the, that is the reason when people say, why is this happening? Yes, it is about health because ultimately the cell therapies are towards this transhumanist program and they want to control you inside and out, but they need you on blockchain or if not blockchain, some sort of interoperable database tracking system for the predictive analytics and they're going to get you there. So Robert Woods Johnson Foundation uh, teamed up with Bloomberg in Austin to put unhoused people on blockchain. Now, ostensibly, it was to put their healthcare records on there, and it did not involve a sensor necessarily. It was a laminated QR code that tied to their biometrics and their health data. Okay, so they call it my pass, <laughs> my pass. Like it should be very clear, and I will say a lot of the conversations around IBM and the Excelsior Pass have focused a lot on the Hollerith cards, which are important, but the piece that doesn't get surfaced nearly as often is that IBM technology was used to enforce the apartheid system in South Africa. And in many respects, that's the more apt program at the moment is the past system and IBM's connection to the mobility, right? If depending on who you are is how you're connected. So the EU is doing the digital vaccines. Um, the Idemia, if you've flown anywhere lately, you'll notice the kiosk was probably an Idemia kiosk. That's a French company. I think it's probably tied to the Rothschilds through France. They're developing augmented identity and driver, digital driver's licenses, so that is coming. The piece at the top is from a blockchain poverty management protocol called Alice SI, and they talk about developing the self-sovereign identity management systems, which allows social organizations to track people. Okay, so we have to understand that the nonprofit institutions, as well as the government support systems, it's all being weaponized. It's all being weaponized. And this will be the other piece of this, and I will talk, go into this later, is that faith communities are often providers of social services. And so they are being drawn into this too. And they are going to have to make a really clear choice about serving people and expanding their mission, whether it's on blockchain or not, and whether they're allowing dispossessed people to be bet upon as commodities. 
And in my, I mean, my position is I don't think people of true faith would think that that is an appropriate way to treat a fellow human being as a commodity for investment, but people are going to have to get really clear about that pretty soon. So can we play this one? So this is an augmented reality clip. I think it's a minute and a half. That's the mobility solution. That's the, key, the Share, that's the sharing economy. Payments, digital payments. Overcome barriers. That's an interesting one. So she's playing with that fountain. That's the augmented cities. And that's, that's the sensor network. We know what that is. One ring to roll them all, folks. So yeah, so there we go. So they're telling you what's coming. Yeah. So again, I'm not a tech person. I do not have a good sense of how close this all is or whether these are ads that they're very close. Like I know that they have pilot programs where they have people as commodities on blockchain, how scalable it is. But they're not keeping it hidden what, um, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not keeping it hidden what their ultimate goal is if we don't say we don't want that, right? And they want us to want it. And they want the children to want it too. That that's the thing. They want the children to want this. So again, if you if you notice, the light motif has been very much about hexagons, right? Um, hive mind, but it's also the most efficient use of space and tiling, which I think is really interesting from a gamification. The settlers of Catan board game is hexagons, and Uber uses its hexagons to tile the world. So I'll just emphasize that Uber is not a, a ride-sharing company. Uber is a geofencing company. Okay. That's what these companies are. They're not ride sharing. They're about not letting you on if you're not compliant. It's, it's a geofencing fencing company. Their mobility solutions will take over public transit systems. They will not let you have your own car. And then that's, that's how it's going to go. So again, uh, leveraging data to predict behavior. I just mentioned about the space. They're going to control this stuff from space. Uh, there was a Harvard Business Review article uh, early last April that said that they needed, they were going to, they suggested using macro eyes uh, technology, which I believe is an Israeli company, to uh, use satellite imagery to predict uh, uh, immunization from space, African children. This was a, framed as an equity issue. Okay, so they're already using satellites to track children from space as an equity issue. Right, so that's, and that's Harvard Business Review, guys. I mean, I'm not making, this is not a crappy source. This is like they're telling you what they're doing. Um, so again, you know, you guys have the, the ride sharing and I would highly recommend, if you're looking for a sci-fi book, uh, there's a book called Rainbow's End by Werner Vinge. He's a professor emeritus of UC, at UC San Diego, math and computing. He was the one who postulated the singularity. He's also, he's written a lot of science fiction books. Rainbow's End talks about a future, a near future dystopia of augmented reality, where everyone wears in the world everybody sees differs depending on how they program it. And, and people aren't allowed to have their own cars. All the cars are autonomous and you have to you know, be able to be allowed to get in them. I will say, you know, I know there's a lot of back and forth about you know, the US, China policies. I will just want to reemphasize that a lot of the social, the credit scoring apparatus originated in the United States. Um, and, and Strive Together has this social emotional learning task force. And I'm trying to remember, Rosenberger, his last name is. I think it's Larry Rosenberger. He's on the social emotional learning task force for Strive Together. And he did, like, was the head of the FICO scoring system for like 30 years and is now into every behavioral analytics company on every board, right? So if it's one thing to point fingers at China, and certainly they have 
a, a situation that allows them to pilot things in ways that are much more seamless. But like, we also have to kind of, you know, don't throw rocks at if you're living in a glass house, guys. You know, we started a lot of this, and a lot of it's running through the IEEE, International Electrical Engineering, Engineers and Engineering Association. They're doing a lot of pilots in China. So they were actually already tracking social credit scoring behavior with people on parole. So imagine you get a workforce pathway, you get a remediation pathway, you're put on it, and then they know by where you check in with your QR code or where you've checked in with your on digital tablets where, where um, if you're compliant to that program. They also in China, they had a QR code mobility solution bike where if you didn't put your bike back in the proper place because people are dropping those scooters and bikes everywhere and littering the sidewalks, like they dock you points on your credit score. So these Internet of Things systems are already happening in small ways. And then we've got the Advanced Mobility Collective, and this is out of, I think, NC State. And you know, they're talking about the packages and all of these things being delivered, um, you know, the 5G technology and the Internet of Things, and how amazing it's going to be. But no one really understands. Like, we need to have like a really heart-to-heart -heart conversation with ourselves about like drone warfare, people, <laughs> because you know, at this point, like the the chickens come back to roost a little bit on that, right? Like, we never really thought about drones being used against us. But you know, it's not all just packages and medicine that they're delivering. They're also collecting all sorts of data and intelligence with that. So this is kind of a thing. I will I will credit Sophia Smallstrom on this because she was the one who introduced me to to the idea of uh, piezoelectric human energy harvest. But this goes very much to what Patrick was saying about within the technocracy element that there's an input output and a balanced ledger system. Which again, blockchain, right? Are we is, is that what they're going to use for it? Um, so they're already talking about this was in 2013, I think, uh, parasitic power harvesting in shoes. And if you don't think like all the high end shoe manufacturers are into piezoelectric, they're talking about sensors and pavement. Every single little tap you make, they want to harvest all of that because how are they going to run their virtual universe? They need every scrap of energy they can get to build it and hold, keep it going. Um, the first social impact bond for health has started now out of Sweden. It is. Um, done in conjunction with Social Finance Israel. Uh, they are connected to an entity that's doing pilots with smart shirts and smart technology, nanotechnology wearables with Stanford. Like they've got new factories in Portugal. Like this is a global thing. Like for any of us to sort of still be also like when we say let's not think about it in partisan terms. Like I think there's one thing to say that we need to, to uh, celebrate our local communities and our identities, uh, but it needs to be in solidarity with everyone else because nobody's an island. You can't stop the internet of bodies because it's run from space at this point. So we need to have solidarity with that. But they're developing the tech, tech now. And this someone shared with me this week, which is just devastating. And this was some of the Netherlands in 2018. They're harvesting human body heat to run blockchain. And you can see it says speculative capital with Bitcoin next to it. So they had a vest and there would be this sensor vest. And like, you know, people like, I mean, imagine that out here, right? <laughs> like if you get sweaty and like they harvest your sweat to power the blockchain. But like these are the things. And like on the one hand, you're like, well, that doesn't seem scalable. I don't know. I'm not saying I'm the expert in this. But what I'm saying is I'm up for asking the ethical questions. Picture a warehouse um, of dispossessed, unhoused people with their blockchain laminate card being tucked in at night and plugged into the blockchain. Like it really is the matrix. It's not that far off of the matrix. And if we are not willing to have the integrity across the political scenario, because I don't think any of us humans who stand for life would accept that that is a future we want for anyone, right? So heads up, that's coming. The other thing is like, piezoelectricity in the pineal gland, which is something I need to know more about and any of you medical people, like I know about calcification, but when I'm seeing things like using um, like transducers and piezoelectricity in your brain, and I know about these brainwave headbands, I'm like, what is going on with that? Like, are they actually not only gonna be your, your you know, blinking, like they wanna put nanowires on your eyelids and your, your throat, so when you swallow, you're creating energy and they're capturing it to power, ostensibly, your wearable device. But, um, and, you know, and who knows it, how much energy that's going to create, but what if your thoughts, would they harvest the energy of your thoughts? And you know, we have BrainCo, BrainCo's already developed these, these are being framed as like biofeedback devices, again, which a lot of people in alternative health systems like biofeedback, so this seems like a nice thing unless it's a parasite on your brain. 
And I would say a lot of the selling of this is around social justice issues where they're triggering, and this is directly through the United Nations, they have virtual reality initiatives around issues of refugees. I mean, serious issues. I am not in no way diminishing the nature of the issue, but they are creating essentially mental propaganda to like create crisis feelings in people's minds. In this thing, it's someone, I think they're standing in a food line and he has a heart attack. And then it's like, you're supposed to role play what you do with the guy on the sidewalk with the heart attack. And you, this, you can see the guy in the virtual reality headset. It's like, he's watching it. And so the measurable behavior change that is part of the game is part of all of this. So that's really predatory. I mean, that's incredibly, incredibly, especially once we understand, you know, U USC Institute of Creative Technologies is Hollywood plus the Army Research Lab. So who's running the game? A lot of these folks you know, military, state intelligence, World Economic Forum, United Nations, hedge funds, media tech, pharma, faith communities. And I always say, like, in the bigger scheme of things, because I feel it's unifying, is the predator energy. And that's something John Trudell, who is a leader in the American Indian movement, he always spoke of the predator energy that seeks to mine the being part of human. And I think at the baseline, it is this, whatever you want to call that, whether you want to give it something that's related to your faith practice or whatever, but there is something out there that is, is anti-life. Who's, who's doing this? So, I, you know, I would bump into these things early on and not really know, what, like, know it was bad and not really understand what was going on. So our uh, school superintendent, William Height, was sitting as an advi education advisor on the board of Ridge Lane LP Limited Partners, the venture, ven venture development at the apex of the public and private sector. So just like this is bipartisan, it runs on public-private partnerships. It is a P3, it is a, a fascist structure, it's a corporate governance structure. And so what they're into, they're the deal makers for these pay for success projects. And they're into real estate, IT, sustainability, and education, yeah, education, right? And so they've got, like, they've got a whole stable of bipartisan former governors, former elected officials, um, they've got all sorts of army generals, and they've got, you know, think tank people, and they got a ton of people, I think, from KPMG or Deloitte, like, these, these guys, they got everybody on there. Ridge is Tom Ridge, our former governor and the first head of Homeland Security, and the his sidekick, R. Brad Lane, is doing some sort of, like, neurocognitive fellowship at Stanford, right? Go figure. I don't know what he's doing over there, but it's probably not good. So, again, the UN, like, we know that the UN development, uh, sustainable development goals are, are the game. That's the rules of the game. You guys have a presence here. I know it looks like it's just in a shopping center. You might want to keep an eye on it. I don't really know how far that goes but like I think there's stuff it's often connected to the universities we know about the globalization the World Economic Forum this is being tied to the dispossession of people people's meaningful life work to robots and algorithms and that's the next phase and it is going to be public private so that's the impact whenever you see impact you know that's that's the game we're in the game if you need a heads up the other piece of this is just and you guys are familiar with the pharma industry as in and of itself like beyond the human capital bonds which i think many people who understand the harm of big pharma haven't yet made the connection expanded their view to the human capital bonds and the behavioral analytics but if you understand that big pharma is now moving into digital therapeutics which is prescription gaming and also the biotech so when I went to Salt Lake City in January and I said, hey, like Utah, you guys have a thousand biotech companies in your state. How are they going to grow? Like literally, because like every state wants to be economically viable, right? You've got a thousand of these. That's a lot. How do they grow? So they are either going to grow because you have ever more people sick or you can compel people who are not sick to use your product because that's their product is a product around the body. It's this human plus. Right, so I mean, if, if Salt Lake City had 1,000, I mean, Arizona Bioscience has uh, 20, 2,100. So you guys are really deep into the, the biotech, and that's the question. If you're building a global, do you want to build it on something that's going to keep you compromised? Um, so again, the game is collective impact, the maze. It's about, again, beyond managing your health, managing your uh, skills. Right? And I think the skills, as I mentioned with the virtual reality, is about giving you a task and having you go through the motions, knowing you're probably never going to get to do that job. They're going to say, we've got all the future of work, we've got all these jobs, you have to reskill everyone. No, because those jobs, they're not going to let you have those jobs. 
Like by the time you get done, they'll say, oh, guess what, that skill is out of date. Could you do a new skill? And so, but the, meanwhile, they're gonna harvest your essence, like your soul, your, you know, how you move, your biometrics to feed the robots. And this has been set up for a really long time. So this goes back to Mark Tucker, anybody in the education space knows. He's the one who wrote the Dear Hillary letter. And I have to say, as someone on the left, like I do have to like strongly appreciate the conservatives who have been calling this out for years because you were right, you were very right, right? He's a very bad guy, <laughs> right? I mean, I will admit, what I, I mean, I did not want to, but it's hard because we're meant to be in each other's boxes and not know. And so like, I can't look at that, that's American Eagle. No, you can, you have to read the letter. It's in the congressional record and it tells you exactly what they're doing now, which is an apprenticeship program. But what they're not saying is the apprenticeship program was to put you in a haptic suit and train the robots. So this is being done with the Chamber of Commerce. And that's why I have a bit of a, you know, back and forth with folks. Like, yeah, it's the UN, but it's also IBM, and it's also Exxon, and it's also Raytheon. It is a, it is a global corporate structure that wants to remake life in a way that they can play God and control. So again, I mentioned the, the Federal Reserve as part of the, the, the pathways of moving. Um, the United Way is a central part of this collective impact. Whenever you see collective impact, they are running the ALICE project. They have captured all of the media. I mean, I think we're all living through knowing what media capture looks like. But even before that, solutions journalism came out of the New York Times op-ed. It's funded by all the same people funding what we're living through right now in terms of the silencing and deplatforming, all these major foundations. And they're going to sell us on poverty management which is not to say that poverty isn't a huge issue, and it's gonna be a bigger issue, but what the way in which they want it managed is going to be very harmful. And a lot of that is tied to the Knight Foundation, and again, that's out of ASU, that, that's underwritten by them. Um, so, and they're working in Tucson, again, on uh, immigration issues, issues that people care about. Like, these are all issues we should care about, but we should care about them in a way that doesn't put people into a technocratic video game. So, I'm just, I've mentioned this before. Who does the social services? Oftentimes it's faith communities, all kinds, right? And that often faith communities that are in positions of having large endowments, they want to be the good people, right? They want to invest their money in things that are good. And they're gonna say, you should invest in these pre-K bonds. They're really good, they take care of kids. And what I'm showing up, like I went to the Unitarians in Philadelphia and they have the Black Lives Matter banner. And I said, but you need to ask, like when you invest your endowment, if you're investing in things like pre-K social impact bonds, does it come with a surveillance play table? Like you have to peel it back a little more because you can't just do the feel good thing. Like, oh, I'm doing the green thing or the kid thing. Like, no, because if it's run on data, if it's a collective impact project, you know, I went to one of these forums with total impact and all of these suits, go, people going in to plan all of this out. It was on Bay Fort first in 2018 and I'm, but me, myself, my little, and I'm like, what are you doing? And I told this guy, I said, you, they're not things to be impacted. The poor are not things that you can impact. They're not your things. They're not things. And it's like he never thought about it. He never thought about it that way. So I will just say this community care system, please look at it, especially if you're part of a faith community or you lean libertarian. This is out of a paper in Idaho. And they're saying like, this is how blockchain is gonna get the government off your back. Okay, so they're saying, look, invest in your community. And yesterday we had an, a very nice discussion about local currency. It's not this. I don't think this is how we want to invest in our people, is on blockchain as in a commodity that has uh, trustless trust that's on a machine. Uh, but that's what they're pushing, and so people need to know that. This is from the Alice platform. This is a blockchain platform in the United Kingdom. It was actually funded by Nominet Trust. And Nominet Trust was the entity that was spun off from the entities that gave all the IP addresses. It was the corporate foundation. So you imagine the Internet of Things, the Internet of Bio Nano Things. The people who are signing the addresses are going to have lots of power and money. So they're setting up this is how you invest in poor people on blockchain. And it's both children, housing, mental health, and global and humanitarian aid because many of these programs are tested in the global aid space first. Syrian refugees in particular. So you can see on this LSI paper that they're talking about a secondary exchange market with trading contracts to provide liquid investments. Okay, that's the securitization of poor people. Okay, because they can't just wait to see if they fix you or not. They need to trade it later. But the trading and the value of that trade is gonna depend on you as a character in the game and what your real-time value and your social credit score is based on the geofencing and the satellite positioning and whether you're complying or not. So yeah, again, just to reemphasize, anything that is an investable commodity, once it's securitized, can also be shorted. 
Okay, and I mentioned yesterday the income sharing agreements that are tied to the New Jersey Career Impact Bonds with social finance. Uh, that platform they're gonna use probably to securitize that debt was set up by uh, Edley and is set up by Christopher Riccardi and I mean, Wall Street Journal says it straight up. The grandfather of CDO is trying to do for higher education what he did for mortgages, okay? Um, so yeah, so it's also the Vatican. We know that they had a big conference recently. They have uh, three social impact conferences, 2014, 2016, 2018. They've been working on it a long time. One of these, uh, social finance is embedded, Omidyar Network is embedded, and sister Helen Alford is an economist, and in one of the talks she says, you know, it's gonna be really great. The, uh, the, the Catholic Church is, is gonna be on the leading edge of um, innovation, and we're gonna be the conscience of big business, and it's gonna be just like 15th century Florence with the bishops in charge of the big book of moral economic decision making. I mean, and like, I'm not making any of this up, but once you read this, you can't sit back and go like, okay, Helen, <laughs> you know, like, I don't think I want the bishop to be in charge of my moral economic decision making. Thank you very much, even as you are the conscience of IBM. No thank you, no thank you. Um, and in our city, actually, Sister Mary Skillian with Project Home, they're doing a lot in, in affordable housing. So they're actually, they've taken away city-owned public housing, they've turned it to privatized vouchers, which will likely soon be, um, uh, Blackstone, you know, the single largest realty provider, and that um, th it's run through the Catholic Church, this housing access, right? So imagine that you're being put on a housing pathway or self-improvement pathway, and you're put into a faith-based community that doesn't match your faith. You know, like, I mean, it could happen, right? And, and the head of our Federal Reserve is a former Wharton professor, Philadelphia Fed, who is, was on the board of Catholic Relief Services. So this stuff is all knit together. Um, so again, you know, inclusive capitalism complements of the Vatican. They just really like to, to be more inclusive, right? I mean, the problem was inclusive, like some people didn't actually want to be included in the plan, right? And then they didn't actually have the choice. Um, so they had this big conference. Uh, recently, the Unite to Prevent, that's the, the Vatican, so they're gearing up for their program. Again, it's the biosecurity state, it's going, the new wilderness, the new manifest destiny empire is your cells, is your cells. So that's Ronald Cohen. Everybody should know Ronald Cohen. I have some articles about him. Uh, Raul uh, Diego did a really nice piece at Silicon Icarus about that. Um, but he's a key player that nobody knows about. And the thing is, at that conference, there were a lot of people from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I will just say. Like, they're, they're, they're very closely together. I've mentioned Salt Lake City as being a center of a lot of the technology. And this is from the Salt Lake Tribune. So if we understand markets and the pressure of markets and how it works, is that if you're investing, where do you put your investments where the imperative is making money, right? And so you're putting them in health and technology stocks. And so, you know, this was, I, I'm not sure, it might have been a couple years ago that these were the top stocks, but you see Apple, Microsoft, Google, this is Ensign Peak Advisors. Um, it says of their stock holding, 7% were split between Apple and Microsoft, right? Johnson & Johnson, Intel, Facebook, Visa, JP Morgan Chase, Health Group, Merck, Berkshire Hathaway, Disney. These are all people who are running this program, I'm telling you, they're running the game, right? And so you cannot, we have to, try to find ways of holding our institutions accountable to us no matter where they are because the imperative within this really toxic game is that they don't. So um, players, I will say, I've been in touch recently with people who are targeted individuals and if you had asked me like a couple years ago, I, I just don't know what I would even make. But after you sit and listen to James Giordano, you listen about neurotech and neuroweapons and smart cities, they need a test bed for this. And it's very likely I think that the platform in which some of, the, some of the stuff is psychological warfare beyond sensory technology or neurotech is um, disruption, like wrecking people's lives, just cutting them off in traffic, uh, sh arguing with them in the grocery store, and that creating that as a gig platform, like an Uber platform, but instead of, or whatever, like driving groceries, you sign up to like harass people like just enough and then pull back. Like, I mean, and I'm not making this up, but I think like I've had people tell me because I had pieces they didn't have and then that was their piece. So I think we have to understand that all of this will have a test bed and we have to be very um, empathetic towards people in that circumstance because everyone tells them they're crazy. And I don't think that they're crazy. I think they're living in an insane world. So uh, Idemia, okay, I mentioned they're, they're setting up your driver's license. So there's your augmented identity, guys. 
Welcome to Augmented Identity World. You are now a cartoon character. We're creating digital twins. Here we'd like for you to level up and emotionally connect with avatars instead of people, right? You're going to love them. Here are some people. Alice, that's the United Way. Their managed poverty program of the working poor. Uh, they're working in partnership with Strive Together, the cradle to career uh, human capital development. And they're with the United Way of Tucson and Southern Arizona, so keep an eye on them. Again, I mentioned about the targeted individuals, but understanding that and potentially connecting to a gig economy of harassment. I mean, if you think harassment is bad just at the level of sort of everyone's psychological hysteria now, imagine monetizing it, right? And gamifying it, right? That's, that's pretty crazy. Uh, so uh, this is from Joseph's game, but it's like a street fight, right? And I'm sort of imagining like, okay, well, what if you have AI that's managing setting people up to like fight other people in the street and you don't even know what's happening, you don't know why. Sometimes things have happened to me and I don't, I don't know why that happened, right? And there's a story that's going on behind you that you don't actually have access to, but you're caught in somebody else's game. Again, your, your ability to transact with the world is dependent on what's in your blockchain wallet. That's not just money, which is what the focus largely is around independence is the, the finance piece, but it's about rights and privileges. They're working, a lot of this is evolution out of Second Life. Second, the guy in Second Life is working on blockchain and uh, gig economies and other things. They, their, their goal is a single sign-on for the internet. Eventually, if you, you will have to sign on to the internet, you will be trackable. The cyber hacks that are like predicted will force that, and then there will be nothing that you can do other than sign on, and they will know where, where you are digitally all the time. Because just like they want to track you in the material smart city, they need to track you in the metaverse too. And that's, that's, that will link your digital twin, your wallet will be sort of your portal between the you you that lives in the world we know and then the virtual twin you that lives in the other world so a lot of the digital twinning is coming through the medical space so they're working on digital twinning uh, the future of health that is from macroize website and you can see that is how they imagine humanity is coded and energetically virtualized but not individualized it's just matter it's programmable matter that's how they see us and the blockchain will also be used to track your cell therapies. That'll be part of the game. In the eugenics, like what is a eugenics for a post-human world? Your electronic health record, and that's what Ezekiel Manuel was to set up with the ACA, was the, the electronic tracking that will be put on blockchain. The rules, we know the sustainable development goals, those are the rules. We know that the sustainable development goals are linked to global finance. This is not really about fixing the problem of climate you know, problems with the climate, problems with the environment, problems with poverty, it's about managing it in a profitable way. So the BlackRock is, you know, I think BlackRock may just be AI, like a reference to AI, that this thing that is like a mega thing, there are people who conjecture that the whole lockdown was predicated on the power that BlackRock has over the world in terms of investments. So New America is funding Arizona State through this public interest technology. Uh, they have something called Bretton Woods II. And again, if you understand, like I, I was brought up with a certain framing around the New Deal, um, and it wasn't, am I after two? Do I have five minutes? Okay, um, so I was hearing that it was like a good thing to take care of people and I didn't understand that there were carve outs and that like domestic labor, agricultural labor, predominant labor of, of black and brown people was not protected and that it was meant to, to, to uh, certain, certain policies and to sort of put like take this lid off and keep the machine going, right, to reset it, to keep it going and this Bretton Woods 2 is going to be the digital currency reset and the gamification of life to keep it going. So um, the, the connection between Arizona states and New America with Eric Schmidt, that is very important. Eric Schmidt is a major player with New America, but they're doing things around policy change, uh, digital impact around government, because they really want a mechanical government, and asset allocators. So it's all gonna sound good. We want stakeholder capitalism. We want the good kind, only we don't really, we don't want that. What works cities, your smart city, the data analytics that keeps the game running. It, it's turning you into the harmonized digital citizen. Estonia is the model. And Tim Draper, who is an actively involved in that development of that program, he says he doesn't think that we actually need physical countries anymore. Because guess what? They're going to put you in the casita and put you in the haptic suit. And they don't need a country for that. I mean, they can go bop around in the real world, but you're going to be, you're going to be trapped. So you're going to have it, Bitcoin as a virtual currency, and, and it can be global. And that's, that's what moves their thing. So you've already got three what work cities at least. Mesa, Scottsdale, and, and Tempe are all in the Bloomberg. Bloomberg is a key person pushing money ball government, data-driven government, data analytics government. A lot of the research came out of actually New York University, the governance lab, which is sort of at the bottom, that purple dot. Uh, Arizona State, they had 
I think seven different conferences, many in the US, but also in Toronto and London and Italy. Um, they had several here at Arizona State University. There, were many, there are many departments at Arizona State that are connected with this larger uh, industrial engineered government lab system. Uh, so Michael Crow is working in not only with the future of war folks in the gamified education, but in the digital government space. And this is just like what one of these things looks like. Like they're, they're gonna come in your house and, and track your parenting on a tablet for a social impact deal. This is coming, I think this one is in Boa Vista, Brazil. So, you know, they've already got it. Is it scalable? I don't know how scalable it is, but it's coming. It's the Panopticon shopping with your DNA. They're gonna nudge you. I don't think it's gonna be a gentle nudge. Food stamps, uh, yeah, it's, it's gamification. It's exactly what Patrick said. It's going to be, uh, if we'll give you some SNAP benefits, but then we're going to trigger whether you buy the good food or the bad food and then incentivize. But in the end, the incentive, they'll cut the things that you can only do it if you always make the good choice. And if you're homeless, if you live in a food desert, if you work three jobs, you may not be able to ever play that game. So, so yeah, so social prescribing, all these pathways are called social prescribing, the assignments, here's your to-do list, here's, here's what you're supposed to do. Uh, your navigator, your social work navigator will put you on the pathway, they'll just wind you up and tell you what to do to be a good, harmonized citizen. Along the way, like we'll control you through the geofencing and that'll be your, your medical status that will constantly test you. Arizona has the healthy community, like who could think there was anything wrong with that, right? If you didn't see all the lead-in photos, you would think that, hey, I want everybody to be healthy, right? Like, no, they don't want you to be healthy. Um, it's important to know that this is linked to privatized welfare and all of the for-profit prison groups are moving into social work. Geo group and core civic, continuum of care, that's what they call it. So they've got your big brother, Bloomberg, he built his European headquarters on the Mithric Temple in London. So those of you who are interested in esoteric stuff, that's, that's going on. It's the gamification here at Arizona State. They're, they're gamifying it all. Thrive is one of these pathway programs and that was developed at Arizona State in the gaming program. And if you hear about UBI, that's gonna be programmed money. They're gonna tell you how to spend it, what you have to do with it. This is a real program, Hustle Score. They're putting poor people online and saying they have to upload their data, show if they're hustling enough, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think I think I'll maybe I'll just stop here. But lo <laughs> local currency, <laughs> skills. You know, they want to put everything on a token. Learn it, earn it, share it. You've got these different quests, health quests. They're working in Orange County. They're going to put people on these pathways with your AI. Rockefellers are involved in both health and education, and they're putting you on a on a data dashboard. So. Yeah, but we, we don't, I don't think that this is gonna be how it's gonna go. Again, I've got the moms here. Um, we, you know, we're energetic beings and this life does not want this. Life does not want this thing. So I know many of you were here yesterday, but I still do have some extra. So I will just, the dandelion manifest. <laughs> like people are like, how do you say all these things? And you actually still say like kind of, but like people need to know. But I, I seriously believe that it's not gonna all come out how they think that they, they are overblowing this, but I think people deserve ethically to know where it is, at least people who have this fortitude to look at it. So thank you. I'm back. <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> so this is, this is my last chick, um, but I really wanna make sure, my entry into all of this was from the education space. And I think if I can leave feeling like I've accomplished something other than like collective you know, weight put on you, is to expand our consciousness to understand that the struggle is for kids. And that it's around, it's around bodily autonomy, but it's also around your mental autonomy and your agency. And the education system is a huge part of that. And the, the biometric digital identity system that's coming through this biosecurity moment is meant to also control their educational access. And as Drew was saying, like knowing the history, right? You know, I was always a really good student in school and I didn't get that history, right? And we still had textbooks and they weren't smart textbooks that tracked when you opened them and what you read <laughs> and your emotional you know, resonance to whatever you were reading. It wasn't any of that. And you know, I remember as a parent, when I started in education space, reading about artificial intelligence and education and feedback loops, and they called it personalized and I was like, well, they're programming children and there's no way to know who got what information or to what end and how they were programming them and so it's it's like the memory hole you know 1984 they can just change the history they can change anything and they can do it to psych you out too <laughs> so i want to make sure that people in the the health space are uh, familiar with how the education piece is going to link up so this is about the kids again it's the cultural erasure and that that hinges on you know what drew was saying that 
people losing languages, people losing cultures, people not knowing their identities. And, you know, a key part of this, and I know even like, especially on the conservative end, like family is really important, people's families and protecting families and the ways in which social services have been weaponized. You know, Philadelphia, we have very high levels of family separation for reasons not of actual abuse of children, but for a lot of other reasons that are not good. Um, and so that, that foundational piece, um, Carlisle Residential School is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania, and um, that cemetery there is where several hundred um, indigenous children who are relocated from various parts of the United States, including the Dakotas, were, were there and made to build the buildings there. Um, and then many of them never left, and they were, they were buried there, and they're along the side of the highway. So I, I took my family there a number of years ago, and it's actually on the grounds of the Army War College. So when I keep saying the asymmetrical warfare stuff isn't over, it's not over the day we pulled in. Yeah, you have to get a security clearance to go on. Um, the hospital where the kids, probably a lot of them died, is now a boutique hotel. And their LED sign that day was about Custer. Okay, so this history isn't history, the past isn't past, we're living it, it's resonating forward. And so when I keep saying that there's this collective trauma that needs to be addressed and start to heal, um, I'm not saying it just in like the, the woke way, but in a very realistic, energetic way that this is our history and if we're taking care of the kids, it's, it's built on this. So when we hear that Jeff Bezos is interested in funding um, Montessori pre-K, okay, just understand that that's the Internet of Things preschool where they're putting sensors in the kids' shoes. Okay, that's what's coming up. And they're gonna seek to separate children from families. And again, I will acknowledge folks on the conservative side have been very clear about that intent. And I, I do agree at this point that that is where it's going is to break up families and make children more and more the wards of the state alongside that model. Um, so I had mentioned before about the Ampli app blockchaining children in South Africa. So Tanzania had the first blockchain babies. Uh, the pre-K app in uh, South Africa was underwritten by UNICEF. So this is part of the, the hijacking of the children. And again, this is just recent, you know, in British Columbia, these hundreds of children, right? And so um, if we understand these digital identity systems, tracking ACEs scores, adverse childhood experiences, metadata, and understanding that that data is often controlled by entities that disempower children and hold that power over them, the idea of grooming children for reprehensible things or even through um, you know, Operation Monarch type mind control systems, they can find the vulnerable people. They've known how to do that for a long time. And, it's, and with this level of data collection, it's gonna become even more intense. Um, so what I realized on that global education futures map and knowledge works, which is out of Cincinnati, um, uh, my first talk I gave in 2017, I put this up and like this was the future of school. And I'm saying this because I know there are a lot of folks coming from, um, again, I at the time I was supporting public schools, neighborhood schools, trying to preserve it as a sense of a, an accountable public space of community. Um, and I, I have a more uh, nuanced understanding of the structure of compulsory public education now than I did when I first started. Okay, but a lot of people are framing it especially with the, the mandates and the poor learning conditions of children who are going back to school, um, that it, it's very oppressive, that the conditions. Um, and the goal was actually, I came across a report a number of years ago where they said they want parents to be afraid to send their children to school. And I thought at the time, because they had closed a bunch of our schools and children were having to cross through dangerous neighborhoods, they meant like physically being shot or part of gang violence. But I think this idea of having parents afraid of sending their children to school was their goal. And their goal is that because the game plays when the children are individual characters and they're separated and out of community, okay? Because the imperative of the system is to isolate, separate, and atomize because the data demands, the growth demands, is everything is more and more fractionalized and made smaller and smaller. So if you can isolate a child and put them in the game, right, the pathway game of education, if you can assign them a pathway, a workforce pathway, a behavioral compliance pathway, a health pathway, you can do that, and for the young children, it's being set up through, um, like, and I, again, I think the faith-based communities will be a part of this, but the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club, they've partnered with United Way and Comcast, and at this point, they consider education simply something delivered on a Chromebook. I'm assuming they'll throw some AmeriCorps volunteers their way, and that will be education, and many people will accept it because they'll say, well, at least our children are our community and we can keep them safe, unlike the public schools, which are terror zones, right? And that is all but being done by design, in my opinion, because their goal is this learning ecosystem model, where they say there will be a, um, a wide variety of digital networks and platforms and contents to support learners 
you know, uh, and that, that some schools, you know, it may involve schools, but it may involve many other things. And so that might look really interesting. If you are a homeschool advocate or an unschooling advocate or somebody who is like looking for alternative education, you might see that and go, well, that sounds pretty good to me, like, because that existing system was pretty terrible, right? Well, within the context of the CIA video game, that's where these children are playing at their education. Okay, and that's what I'm saying. It's constructed pathways that are not gonna to be to their choice and is going to be essentially child labor creating digital value for companies and the surveillance state and pay for success deals, right? So, and this will be connected to digital vouchers, education vouchers. I, I expect within the health community, there will be, your, your health savings accounts will be digitized and there will be, um, they will make you feel like you have a choice. They, won't, they will frame it as a choice option, but it is, we are all continuing to play in their game. And it's, it's a game that's where the rules are not to our advantage. So this is me, I, a couple weeks ago, um, I have a, a newly made friend, he's a high school teacher actually at Constitution High School, and he refused to, to, to go back under the learning conditions, conditions to submit to these uh, testing protocols, uh, health testing protocols that were under emergency use authorization, and also specifically saying that the conditions for the kids who were still being taught online in school only for maybe 10 days out of the remainder school year, most of which was standardized testing, was harmful to those children. And many of his students in high school had said that they were having real issues with mental health and depression. And on his conscience, he couldn't go back. You know, and, and he's a teacher at Constitution High School, literally two blocks from the Constitution Center, right? And so they, they put him off on unpaid leave and he's struggling through like disciplinary action right now. And, no, and we had with very little support. So we went out on the median outside the school district and we've been just holding up signs and saying like, we support human-based education. We support non-data driven education. Like we support Neil in this work. And you know, I've been to the school board. It's on a, a major Broad Street, North Broad Street, you know, just north of City Hall. And um, it's interesting because the school board building used to be the printing presses for the Philadelphia Inquirer. So if you imagine like children being the plain paper, reels of paper and the information printed on them, like it's kind of a, <laughs> an interesting metaphor, right? The printing press, like you will be printed upon, right? The imprinting. So, but at Kitty Cross, uh, the street from there is a giant data center. Okay, so this is, this is a me standing in front of the window of the data center that says the, the journey, your journey to the cloud begins here. And later down, further down the block, there was another window papered over with eSports that were targeting women and people of color. Okay, so they want them to be heroes in the game. That is how this game is set up. And we were saying, you know, unplug the kids. Um, a number of years ago too, when I, before I really understood transhumanism or where all of this was going, I just thought these people were really deluded. Uh, Carnegie Mellon had developed an online uh, peer-based learning because they say children learn better with peers. So we will put uh, cartoon peers on a television and have them interact that way for their education. Now clearly at this point, now I know they're training, the, they're getting the data harvest to feed the robots, to train the robots to be you know, more human-like, but I couldn't understand why you would even have that thing. Like why, and it was framed as equity, you see culturally diverse, and probably also STEM. They were probably teaching them STEM stuff. <laughs> you know, so this is coming out of, out of Carnegie Mellon, which does incredible amounts of defense contracting. But again, this is from, you can't quite see it, but this is Joseph's game again. These characters are armatures, and th these arms are sticking out, and it's, they just have to hang there until they get enough data to know to be programmed to what to do, right? So it's like, on the one hand, the things are programming the children, and on the other hand, the children are programming the things. So this is another piece of military technology that I found. Um, this is from the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies for the Navy. It was a deliverable, this is 2016. This personalized assistant for lifelong learning, I think they'd been working on that since like 2008, if not earlier, a lifelong learning assistant. And this little video, it, that, that learner, helping learner, flies around like a drone. Like, and, like it's sort of creepy like Disney, like here, let me be your learning assistant for your life, you know, your whole life, you never get away from me because I'm your perpetual minder. And you know, I just did a podcast on this program called Stimuli, which is essentially a hybrid learning school as a video game. This young woman is saying it's school, but it's a video game. And you come in as an avatar, and if you notice where the arrow is pointing, there's a hoverball eyeball floating that follows the child around. I mean, it's, they just come up and like you play in the game and there's this floating eyeball, like you're in the panopticon, like literally that's what they're telling you. And so like to me, I'm looking at, this is from Joseph's game, drone surveillance, and those characters have their arm out because they haven't been programmed yet. But I'm thinking beyond the packages, beyond potential weaponized drones, 
is and beyond surveillance is data aggregation, right? Like what if your personalized learning assistant was a drone that followed you around all the time with a, a camera to learn you so that your digital twin that was hanging out with his arms hanging open could like move around or do something. And you know, the other piece of this is like all this data is being stored in Bluffdale, which is again part of that larger Salt Lake City enclave. And when I first read about, um, there's a really good book called, a uh, movie called Citizen Four about Snowden. And I'm still, at this point, I'm still not so sure about all of it, but at the time it was quite shocking for me to understand all of what was going on. And they talked about Bill Binney and the Bluffdale Center holding 100 years of data on each person. And like, I don't know that Bluffdale isn't being used for digital twinning, right? I mean, they say it's, it's there, they, they store it unless it's a FISA order and then they go in and get your data. But there's no saying that they couldn't necessarily use that data to build the simulation systems. That looks like it's in the middle of nowhere, that photo. It's, it's five minutes off the highway. I went and smudged it. <laughs> I went there and smudged it. I said, you don't have our permission. You know, and literally, like they had, like it was like high security, and, but there was a bit of a pull off and we pulled in and, this, and we pulled over and like there was wire, like I wasn't trying to get in trouble, but I just wanted to get as close as I could to say like, you, you can't, you know, you do, I'm, this is not okay with me. And there was a, like a watchtower and it looked like an internment camp. It literally looked like something out of one of these dystopic video games. So they really want the social emotional learning, and I think I mentioned that yesterday, just be very cautious because while yes, we do care about children's emotions, we don't care about it within the state of scientism and technocracy because that goal is, is not, it's a dual purpose and they're not doing what they're telling you. So this guy, it was at Heckman's meeting, you know, I mentioned yesterday, he's like, well, let's incentivize the parents with pornography. Oh, just kidding. So this is later on in his meeting, he's with Otis and this is part of this, uh, NWEA like map testing and he's saying well you know we're testing uh, as a former administrator of a Chicago area suburban public school do you think I'm going to tell parents we're tracking their kids neuroticism nope we're going to find some other way to say it that doesn't pack the school board room and so this, this is being embedded in the online standardized testing for the children so they're tracking the ocean traits and I can't remember all what each of them stands for it's like outgoingness, conscientiousness, extroversion, something, and the N is neuroticism, right? So they're, 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 they're tracking that. And, and my nemesis, my child's school, it was a magnet school. It was a public magnet school, okay? So lots of, you know, academic people would send their kids to this school. And I was on the school council. I was a parent rep on the school council. And I walked in one day and everyone's got, like, got grit t-shirts on. So Angela Duckworth, is a Penn professor in positive psychology and she's the grit professor. She's like, everybody's gotta be gritty. It's like a bootstrap gritty kind of world, people. And she runs something called the Character Lab. Now the Character Lab, like when they were doing this, this big thing with MacArthur, she didn't win, but she got a bunch of money from Facebook, Chan Zuckerberg. Um, and so this, you know, so her kids were at my kid's school and she's putting grit in my kid's school. And I got grit out of the school because I said it's entirely inappropriate that this is here. But when she was working on this character lab, you can see the gratitude playbook, the curiosity playbook, the grit playbook. These are all data collection categories for the character lab. And I thought, again, it's word spells. Like, oh, you mean like good character, like somebody has good character. No, we're talking about the people with the arms hanging out. They're building characters. They're building characters. They literally are building characters. So, you know, you I, I, can I prove it? I can't prove that. But like, they're harvesting the children to, to, to this system. So again, you can see here, they're very, she and Heckman, she works, Angela Duckworth, with, with um, James Heckman on uh, psychology. And they're like, we, we need psychology to do our labor force modeling. And we really, there's a focus on soft skills. So the stimuli program that we looked at before that was the virtual video game was partnered with IBM and Microsoft and these other companies and they were, most of the education was outsourced to online mentors, corporate mentors uh, for children and that they would do chats and it's, they said surprisingly corporate people didn't want to spend a lot of time mentoring like middle school children, right? Because they've got work to do because they're corporate people, right? Like the teachers know should be teaching the children. No, but like they're having these mentors and they said well to make it convenient the, the mentors would upload minute long clips and then they would talk about it in the text chat box with the people. Well the thing is all of this AI machine learning also does sentiment analysis. Okay, so all of that paper trail, all of that digital dust is being mined to profile these children with, as they develop the soft skills or not. Because they want to know, again, who is the leader, who is the follower, who is the person who is not 
going to go along with the program, who is the person who will do it to your face, but cut, you know, like they want to know all of this thing. So they're framing it as a workforce. They're like, oh my gosh, the future of work, nobody knows how to work anymore. These terrible people are just not working very well. But like we, if we just track them better with their soft skills, we would do that. And again, you can see a USAID involved. So that's global aid systems again. And they're, they've done a lot, a lot on Syrian refugee populations. A lot of the biometrics were tested on them. So again, these are some of these character labs, but it just shows you the programming. When you actually sort of peel it back and you imagine like we talk about programming or propaganda or media programming, but if you actually create this digitally twin universe, there are programs. And I, I, you know, I, I really am grateful to my friend Joseph who has ex deep expertise in how to make this happen because he could share something like this with me and I don't know how to operate it, but it's complex, right? It's a complex system and looking at how to model uh, a society at scale, I think is that's what they're working on. So again, I, I mentioned mining the children. To do this human capital finance, you've got to get them on the blockchain. They've got to be trackable in the supply chain. Um, on the family separation issues, this is another coded issue. Uh, prenatal care and home visits. So Heckman's equation for the 7 to 10% ROI on early childhood, up to 13% if you include health data. So that's where we're going to get smart playgrounds and smart fitness shoes and Fitbits, you know, for the health data. Um, they want to get in people's homes, okay? Now, if you understand that men, many kids are separated from their families not for abuse situations, but because of uh, poverty, right? So it's on negligence, but it's simply because the parents don't have the money. All right, so what you're saying in, in the state of Washington, I have some friends that pushed back on this and managed to, they wanted to get into people's homes within like two or three days of arriving home from the hospital to get and start managing the women and, and their children in their homes. And now increasingly it's on tablets, right? I, I had showed one of those Alice or Shanzai City tablets where they're using AI facial recognition to film people, to film parenting behaviors. So Nurse Family Partnership, which has been around since the 60s, and I mean has a certain reputation, is embedded in all of these um, you know, states now. I mean, they're throughout everywhere. And actually, um, I, I got in touch with the state treasurer of South Carolina because he was fighting this in South Carolina. Uh, and they were the pilot for the Nurse Family Partnership home visits. And what went along with that was this thing called Goal Mama app. Okay, so they said the only reason women are in poverty is because they're just, they don't have their goals structured properly. They just need a d digital nudge. If they just had a digital nudge at the right time, they would behave properly and they would not be poor. So the woman who developed this app is the wife of Pierre Omidyar, founder of eBay, who's head of Omidyar Network that's pushing uh, universal digital identity. And she has like a neuroscience patient compliance lab called Hope Lab to make sure patients are compliant. So she helped develop this and then Nurse Family Partnership implemented, okay? So the thing I was trying to tell this treasurer of South Carolina um, is, hey, the other thing is all these, like the state treasurer manages the money, right? The investments of the pension funds and the college savings accounts. They're gonna try to get you guys to invest in the pre-K bonds, right? And they're gonna say it's a good thing for the state, we'll invest in our people. And so we're, we're trying to figure out how to fight it, but the challenge is, is most people don't have the bandwidth to know, but this is, a, this is a paradigm, and I have to say most of the people who are on to addressing the issue of home visits, which is not to say that I don't want women to have prenatal care or appropriate support or access to medical care of their choice that they're comfortable with, but getting in people's homes and getting data analytics on them and their family relationships I think is highly problematic given the power imbalance. So this is another piece. I did um, a post on ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experience Scoring. And again, that came out of Kaiser Permanente, which is a major impact investor and managed healthcare space. And it's around preventative care, which sounds lovely unless you understand that preventative care is a prescriptive social prescribing pathways. Um, to enable all of this, right? It's like, because they actually don't care about you being healthy, they just care about you being busy, <laughs> look, trying to look healthy, right? And so when I wrote this ACEs article about why is it a rubric? Why is it a number? I'm not here to say, like, I have personal experience where I do feel that uh, childhood trauma does have long-term health implications. Um, I'm not saying that it doesn't, but why is it a score and who does it benefit? So Kaiser Permanente went over to the NHS and was advising on their managed care. And my, my article went a little viral in Scotland. And I'm like, well, why, what, Scotland? That's a little odd. Well, it's also Carnegie. <laughs> like, oh, this is also Carnegie Corporation. So Carnegie is both Scotland and here. But they said, well, you know, did you hear about this named person scheme? 
Like they're in our schools and they're trying to break up our families and have families take these surveys and collect all of this inscrutable information and they have assigned uh, these data collection centers where they're gonna assign a minder to a child outside the family from birth to track them. And then that eventually got shut down by the Scottish government in 2019 after quite a bit of litigation. But they were already assigning non-family mi child minders and they've been doing that um, in Scotland. Um, so again, you know, er so there are many, many, like whenever you see these national campaigns, and I'm not in any way saying these aren't issues, but like when you see the decoding dyslexia, ACE is aware, like they're, and they're all in every state, and they're like, no, we, we promise we're, we're grassroots. You know, there's a reason. And so like Arizona, I would say most people who are operating this space have good intentions, right? Very few people get into this because they want to hurt kids. And it's, it creates a lot of cognitive dissonance if you say, by the way, this is going to be tied to impact. And within these impact markets, they run on broken people. Right? It, it's if the logic of this market is that if you can make a profit managing people who are impoverished or traumatized and ameliorate it, if you're making money at it, you'll only grow more poverty. Like there's no incentive to actually make that poverty, that trauma go away. You might manage it better. You'll definitely manage it in a way with a lot of data analysts, which are the new like scientism element, but you're not going to eliminate it. And so that's what people who are enmeshed in the structure, we have to figure out a different way that doesn't involve global finance. Um, the same with the digital, the neural engineering of children's brains. You're hearing so, so much about cognitive neuroscience. Oh, look, we know so much about children's brains now. You know, if children don't do all the right things by the time, you know, they're, they're in kindergarten, they're three years old, like they're ruined, right? And so we're going to engineer their brains to optimize them for the Borg, you know, essentially. And it's neural engineering. And, and you know, I'd mentioned yesterday about the surveillance play tables tied to the digital identity. Um, people need to, to understand if you're talking about making impact markets in brain, building brains of children, what brains are they building? Like, wh like if it's what works brains, like if you've got what works government, what works brains, what kind of brains is building and to who is building it and using what technology that benefits who? Because I, I have a lot of concerns. So a lot of this I've talked about blockchain, the, the, the geofencing, the education vouchers, the whole idea of pay for success finance runs on interoperable data because it is the fiction that they can predictively profile you as a burden and then fix you and then gamble on this little thing of profit. It's a total fiction, but it's their fiction and they've got the money and the government and the military in their pocket to make it happen, right? And so it doesn't necessarily have to be blockchain at this point. These interoperable databases for predictive analytics already exist. And so this is an image of pre, you know, health past year, whatever. Um, I was looking at Clever, which is the interoperable database for ed tech, and they, they put these QR codes. Now, I didn't really deal with QR codes at all before this past year, right? But Rocket Ship Academy, which is a charter school, they said, oh, these poor kindergarten children, they can't log into all their programs fast enough because they don't even know all their numbers and letters. So what do we do? It takes us two hours to log everyone in, and they have five programs they have to do. Well, their answer was a QR code tied to their identity that would inter aggregate all the data across all the platforms. And they're like, but the kids could decorate them with stickers and it was really lovely and they would just hold the QR code up to the camera and that was the mining of the children. So you can even see in their advertising this idea of centaurs, the human computer interfaces, is this young girl and it, these were kindergartners with headsets and Chromebooks and the headsets were like in the, the, the one and a half minute clip falling in front of their eyes like because they were not even like able to hold the headsets on properly because they were like babies, right? And, and so they're turning, this, this slight, child is slightly older, but into a transhumanist, right? It's a person, but her hand, as it becomes the QR code, becomes a cartoon character. So this is the total quality management. Again, it's the pathway. It's managing children as data that strive together. So that's already in, that's in Arizona. Uh, that's part of the knowledge works learning ecosystem, but moving them from kindergarten to employment forever on the pathway as data. So again, this is just talking about pay for success finance, health plans in Arizona schools. So they're gonna medicalize your kids in schools. And, and I know people have been talking about that for a long time, but because Obama gutted the uh, Student Data Privacy Act, FERPA, uh, it, it, if you conduct medical or behavioral health or physical health procedures in schools, the data is not protected under HIPAA. And this a lot laxer. So anybody who's collecting that data can use it for the purposes of these financial deals. Okay, and that's why they want the health clinics in schools. 
It's not, you know, they want them in Philadelphia. And I'm like, we're a city, we have a lot of health centers. Like if we want health centers, it's not like we're in Alaska that, they, you know, it's, they, they want them in the schools so that they have easy access to the data for what they want to use it for. So these are all of the entities that are part of this program in Arizona and social finance is the key player there, right? But you can see all of these people's jobs are, are relying on the system running. So when you start questioning it, all the people who are implied by all these things, they have to stop and think like, whoa, what am I a part of? And like their immediate pushback is gonna be like, no, I just want kids to be healthy. Like I just want them to be fit. I want them to eat good food. You know, like they're, they're not gonna say like, oh, is this about like the Israeli and social finance and the smart shirt and the, you know, Warburgs in Sweden? Like they're not gonna think that because they don't know any of these things and they're not supposed to know. But I'm here to tell you like this healthy outcomes is, we all know the deck is stacked against the healthy outcomes. So, I think I mentioned yesterday my friend who is the main school teacher about uh, her co-teacher bringing in the, the Fitbits, the wearable technology that like, hey, if you, you know, if you work out, UNICEF will give a food packet to a, chi a needy child, <laughs> right? Well, so this is the issue. And, and if we talk about, I, I, I think I didn't get a chance to go into it in much detail, but that piezoelectric energy harvest, if you start imagining that there are ways for them to capture with smart shoes or smart gym uniforms that like, hey, let's do gym and feed kids in Syria, you know, here, feed the refugees. And by the way, we're pairing with blockchain. You know, like, I, I, I don't know that that wouldn't all happen, that these pieces are all running together and how would they stop? And it's being tar branded in very certain ways. It's being branded with Star Wars and Target and made to look like fun and colorful. But this UNICEF is connected through to Singularity University and, and, and the tech interests. Um, so, you know, they're, they're saying that Singularity University wants to benefit women and children, but I think really what the goal is is to erase women and children. I mean, I, th I think that, that, that this, this goal is, is to, to benefit to them to the extent that they can transmute them into an, 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 a digital simulation. So again, this is just more kid power. You can see it's part of the brand franchise. This is mass media, consumer culture, uh, self-surveillance. Kid power combines popular culture, gamification, and self-surveillance with the sciences of the body and data analytic technologies <laughs> to produce a device and a platform that link personal health with global health. It makes physical fitness into a key indicator of responsible citizenship. I mean, that is really bad, right? But it's Star Wars, right? So we should all just go along, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, and that's, that's like what, when Drew was saying, like trying to deal with some of these histories, like there is a lot of process when we're like everything we were taught isn't what we thought. Like Sesame Street isn't what I thought. Like Star Wars isn't what I thought. Like these things, UNICEF with the little like collecting quarters at Halloween, like wasn't what I thought. Um, and so, but it is what it is. You need to know. So telehealth, telehealth is coming to the schools, such that the kids are still in schools. Telehealth is after them both for their physical and mental health. It's not just them getting vaccines in schools, it's all sorts of other medical procedures that, which will be mediated online and will be mediated online because that information has to be part of the pay for success deals and has to be scalable. So they don't have time for nurses to write down their own records and file them away. Like I'm saying, Philadelphia, we had terrible shortages of school nurses and we had very high rates of asthma and chronic illness in our schools and they would not pay for nurses. You would get like a nurse a day and a half a week. And if you're a rich school, then maybe you could shovel, like move the budget around and get a nurse for two more days. But they're not there because they're paying health uh, professional health professionals. They're, they're, they're doing it to enrich these telemedicine businesses. Um, and again, the daily pass, that's part of the Los Angeles uh, vaccine passport for school access, but that was being used to both track symptoms, uh, track test results, schedule injection appointments. And so once you have that QR code, when we think about my pass, you know, in Austin, in the digital identity, like once you've got that QR code attached to that kid in their biometrics, you've got their digital identity, right? And all that data starts to layer like, oh, well, did they get, what are their, you know, health stats and how does it compare to their test scores and all that data start, what did they eat? Are they on free lunch? What, what did they get the apple or did they get the hamburger? You know, all of that starts to add in. And digital therapeutics, I would think most people in the healthcare space are not aware that big pharma is now moving into something called digital therapeutics. Achille was developed at UCSF, a Neuroscape, Adam Gazelli, and then he spun it out to a for-profit company in Boston, Achille, which has many big pharma backers and investors, including uh, Joy Ito, who used to be with MIT Media Lab. They did the clinical trials at Duke. So this is a prescription video game 
for ADHD, pediatric. Pediatric prescription video game ADHD. It's passed, it's out there. Um, so imagine your child is enrolled in school after all of this trauma of the past year and they say, oh, you know, your child, they, they need to like a little tune up on their executive function. I, I think we should prescribe this video game. And, and then you're a parent, you're like, I, I don't think so, no thank you. And, you know, and they're like, hmm, well, maybe we should send social services to your house, you know, because your kid really needs this video game. You know, and so that's what I'm saying is what's coming if we don't pay attention because digital therapeutics are a really big thing. There's a whole digital therapeutics alliance, transforming global healthcare by advancing digital therapeutics for clinical and health economic outcomes. So the health economic outcomes is the impact investing space. And here there, it's all framed as social determinants of health. It has a very deep um, social justice component. Again, not saying that that is not a reality, that there are disproportionate negative health impacts in black and brown communities, low income communities, food deserts, uh, environmental racism. Like I live in a, you know, I work in a part of the city that has refineries and trash transfer plants and everything is predominantly black neighborhood. Like there's no amount of meditation and walking you're gonna do to overcome your asthma from toxic environments, right? But that's not how this is set up. That's not how this is set up. Um, they're doing digital vaccines. I, I don't know how many people who are working in the, vac the health, child health space are realizing that they're doing, this is for uh, diabetics. So they're going to set you on your pathway, your Fitbit pathway, to uh, keep you from being pre-diabetic, right? And that's a huge issue. Um, but if you, if I don't know where you guys are, Philly Public Schools, most of them don't have kitchens because they were built at a time when you would go home for lunch, and so the food is prepackaged in plastic bags and microwaved, and it's terrible, terrible food. They they don't even make like they're giving kids good food. So I mean, this stuff is ridiculous. Behavioral health, Neo World. <laughs> this is another video game that they're aiming for schools for special needs students. Uh, I would say students with, um, especially parents of vaccine injured children who have IEPs related to that need to be very careful because those are students who are being targeted for these interventions. Like English language learners, students with IEPs are being targeted specifically. Um, this pilot was for New York City schools. The program was funded by a guy who was in big pharma and media in New York City. Uh, it was piloted, that research was done in Australia. The app for this uh, gamified heroes game was piloted in China. Uh, it had research R&D from Scotland and Indonesia. And, and then it boomeranged back around to the New York City Special Education Division. Okay, and, and then the NAACP bought a bunch of Chromebooks so kids could do this game, but it was targeted specifically at opposition defiant disorder, ADHD, and like spectrum, and uh, one other one. But it was targeting kids, and they're like, look, we gave them, we tested it at the end of the day when the kids were falling apart anyway. It was really great. Essentially, it's a digital sedative. And they're framing it, though, you can see as a homeschool. So everything that they're doing to public schools in this learning ecosystem model is going to boomerang back into non-public schools, it will come into your house because once they give you a digital voucher and track the data, everything, all the bad things that they would do to public schools, they're gonna be now in your living room on the device if we don't intervene. Um, so yeah, so Arizona State, I, I make these big maps. They have a center for games and education. Uh, this is a bit of a close up, you can see. Uh, the collection of skills badges like the Pokemon Go, that is being happening but through Advanced distributed learning. So advanced distributed learning has broken down education into something that is uh, noun verb object statements. I did this. Uh, it's military, uh, it's military R&D, uh, scaled for the world. Uh, advanced distributed learning set that up and then Arizona State has a partnership lab with them. Uh, and then they have something called total learning architecture and it's tied to human performance measurement language. Okay, so they're totally coding people. Uh, this total learning architecture is feeding into the labor force database over here, the workforce readiness and the future of work. So this is in Raleigh, Durham. Uh, their skills that you collect like Pokemon Go badges are collected through this uh, XAPI technology um, that was developed by Rustici Software. So these are all, this is the skill collection, the skill token, but is foundational in military technology. And the fact that Arizona State has a partnership with advanced distributed learning is significant. Um, and again, he, over here is the, the Arizona Department of Education, the scholarship accounts and the class wallet, which is an online education savings account, a digital crediting system. But you know, here, look, you can buy your curriculum from Amazon, isn't that great? Or Best Buy maybe, right? Because like we all wanna buy our stuff from corporate America. And so, the, okay, so this is ADL. You can sort of see 
Um, like this is what education looks like to them. Like there's the military guy, like there's the learning locker, you know, these various, like you can learn on a tablet, you can learn with wearable technology, you can like learn with a sensor. It all goes in your permanent learning locker for the blockchain. More hexagons, this is transmedia learning. This is essentially multimedia learning across platforms so that you, you're in a quest and that your data is tracked um, through your metadata, through all of these different sites, social media, virtual worlds, videos, you're engaging, but your data follows you. So like everywhere you show up, it's kind of like when you, when you look at shoes online and then your, the shoe ad follows you everywhere, it's the same thing. Uh, this is the we can track it, the API. And again, do you want learning where the army says we can track it? Learning happens everywhere, we can track it. This is, a, I would encourage when I send out the video that you guys look, it's only a minute and a half. And these flip, they're a little analog and they're like, I learned on my phone, I learned on my tablet, I learned you know, in all of these places, but it's all tracked, it's all tracked. And this is, here we go, here's Sophie again with the robot spying on her, being tracked. Education for virtual worlds, I guess I'm getting close. Um, in 2016, the, the DNC was in Philadelphia. Uh, Atlantic Magazine had a whole conference where they brought in folks to talk about um, the future of education and the creative economy. And I thought, my friend said, you gotta go to this, Allison. And I'm like, okay. So I go, and it was Suzanne Del Bene from the state of Washington. She's the head of the Internet of Things, uh, one of our progressive city council people, the uh, head of Epic Games, I think Paul Megan, yeah. Uh, this woman, Constance Steinkuhler, who does military gaming, and then the moderator. And essentially, during this whole thing, Paul Megan was just like, we need the kids to code our games. We need kids to train to code our games. And I'm like, well, this is kind of an odd thing for you to say like for an hour, like we need the kids to code your games. Like, well, that's not education. And at the same time, I'm thinking like, I'm still, I'm not getting it, right? And so it was like maybe six to, you know, 10 months later, I'm like, they have to build the virtual world. Like your game is the virtual world. Like this is empire. Like you're like, the kids gotta build it. They gotta build the virtual empire. And then we need everybody coded, everybody on STEM to build the virtual world. Um, so again, Fortnite was, was, is Epic Games among their stable, but they have something called Unreal Engine, which is building synthetic people and using them in advertising. They scaled Fortnite uh, with the money from Tencent. Uh, Tencent owns stock in many, many, many video game operations. And I could just say, like, if you are planning some sort of, like, the amount of biometric and metadata that's collected in multiplayer games is pretty intense. So if you just wanted to, like, pocket that and understand, like, how do people play Fortnite in um, Alabama and in London and in, um, you know, Melbourne or other places so that you could plan your asymmetrical warfare? like just sit on that for a while, right? That data doesn't go away. Like the 10 year old today that's playing it late into the night, like soon they're gonna be 18, right? And then they'll know. They'll have a pretty good basis of baseline of behavioral data. So uh, Center for Games and Impact, again, impact is social impact. Um, the Ses Joan Gantz Cooney Center is Sesame Workshop. You see USAID, so that's Global Aid Systems, Intel, MacArthur is all about the badges and learning ecosystems through collective shift in this LRNG. Um, Thrivecast, I'm gonna talk a little bit, well I talked, to, I showed it very briefly before. This is your list of assigned do, things to do for, to make self-improvement pathways. And this is coming straight out of the Center for Games and Learning. And this woman, uh, Anna Arici, I think, she developed this Quest Atlantis, which if you listen to me yesterday, there, um, Crow talked in a clip about meeting with Bill Gates about developing a game that you would play with no grades and no teachers, and you would just play it until a certain point, and then once you got done with the game at the conclusion, you could pass any entry-level exam for college. And so I think like that's part of this transmedia storytelling. You're in a quest, you're a game character, you're in this narrative, you're navigating it, but you're also competing against AI, and it is learning you, and so it's not really a fair game because it's, you're, you're teaching it about you as you play it, and then it can manipulate the outcomes. So again, Hewlett Packard, working on human capital analytics, they've got this uh, education data command center. Uh, you know, if you understand that Hewlett Packard is also working in border control in Gaza, you know, that also puts it in a different light. Uh, they're also involved deeply in biometrics, they're also interested in digital bio bi biological computing. <laughs> Right? So you, you've got something that's got your biometrics that can print you up some nice like personalized bacteria and you, you track you as human capital. Oh, and by the way, like we, we run a militarized border, you know? And it's kind of intense. And you know, I actually had an engagement with a, a, a person who was like her profile picture on Twitter was like a young high school kid taking a Hewlett Packard box to school and it's like this demand for digital equity. And I'm like, but do you know what you're asking? I don't think a lot of us understand. 
So trusted learners, this is what Crow is building, is this digital representation of people as human capital. Lumina Foundation is, is betting on these futures. So all the betting stuff that I'm talking about, the credit transparency initiative, um, extended uh, transcript wallets, uh, Lumina and Salesforce, that's Mark Benioff. Robin Hood is this guy, Paul Tudor Jones, who literally dresses up like Robin Hood in tights at the Javits Center with, for his hedge fund. Um, yeah, it's pretty intense. Um, so, you know, the ACT is involved in this, the work keys, badge to hire, strategy labs for badges, it's all badging and data analytics. And so it's running people as if they're just data sets. Again, this is the military, this is transmedia learning. Elaine Rayborn, she works at Sandia National Labs. She's talking about scaling, training thousands of learners. Again, Crow talks about, you know, their aim is a billion person online university, like run by the military. So that's kind of crazy, but measurable behavior change, that's the impact markets. Well, anyway, we've got Michael Crow, InQtel, Niantic, Future of Work down here, um, and these are, uh, yeah, the scholarship accounts. This will tug at your heartstrings just a minute. So this is in Salt Lake City. Jim Sorensen is a key impact investor. And this was actually a gathering around human capital finance for juvenile delinquency, okay? But in the end, there was a woman who worked for a food pantry. And she said, you know, um, you're talking all about these social impact bond deals, and you know, I don't really think any of them are gonna work if people are hungry. I think if people are hungry, that's a, you know, like you're not, none of the other stuff is gonna work. And so Ian Galloway, he's with the San Francisco Fed, this is him here, he's like, well, you know, like the thing about these deals is you have to have the cost offset. You know, we, we haven't figured the cost offset yet for hunger. Maybe test scores. Maybe test scores would be the cost offset for hunger, child hunger. Okay, and so that's, and the, the very sad thing was the woman who had asked the question, like people are so anxious to be part of the system, she, she was just sort of grateful, right? Like no one stood up to say, how dare we create a society where hungry children are made to perform your behaviors to eat. Um, so again, the school lunch program is a central part of this. They've connected to this to biometric payments, and that's, I think, part of the universal feeding program. Again, I don't want any kid to go hungry, but I also don't think they should have their biometric data tracked against what they eat for an impact market. Um, they're putting vaccines in food now. They're also setting up food-based, uh, food, uh, school-based food pantries for food insecurity, where you take good deeds as payment, which sounds really cute unless it's like tied to the blockchain and your good behavior in class depends on your family if your family eats. Okay, that's not good. Uh, I will say the pre-K database system was essentially set up by a guy who formerly worked to set up the case management software for the FBI. <laughs> so that's kind of weird. Like when you find these things, these are the things I find. I'm like, why is the guy like who spent 10 years building FBI casework doing preschool pre-K data analytics? And, and this, this, these are the analytics. Data Zone, I mentioned before, Silicon Valley Regional Data Trust with David Hausler who put the, uh, where is David Hausler? Chan Zuckerberg. So there, Priscilla Chan, Mark's wife, was there. And, um, oh gosh, where is David Hausler? Oh yeah, here you go. Genomic researcher David Hausler. So why, is, why do they want all the kids genomics? And then it feeds into this National Interoperability Collaborative, which is where it pivots to health. And these feed to the Council on Crime and Delinquency and the Fusion Center. So all of the school-based data is being fed upstream into these systems. And nobody's looking all the way up. Um, virtual reality education, this is our new head of education, you know, they're harvesting the kids. Um, augmented reality, they're capturing all this data, heart rate, uh, visual location, time taken, biometrics, eye focus, emotions, motion sensing, they're training them to be Amazon workers. Uh, they're training them to uh, sit, be locked in casitas, and so these guys like work. You're locked in, this thing works, and this is tied to Ericsson. So all the stuff about Sweden being great isn't great because Sweden is pushing this. So there is a big virtual reality lab here, so people should be aware of that. Um, you your, earn your skills, that's the XAPI, uh, the Trusted Learner Network, again, Arizona State. They're putting, look at these children in headsets. These are like maybe, I don't know, six, seven-year-old kids. They're all in headsets. That's not normal, that's not normal. I wanna just say they're closing down on the pineal gland, that those VR headsets, the blue light, it hurts, it suppresses melatonin, okay? So it's disconnecting children from their real world. Uh, there's this talk, this, the child awakening consciousness of the soul, it's by the World Goodwill um, group. World Goodwill is out of the Lucius Trust. The Lucius Trust was formerly the Lucifer Trust. They work closely with the UN, okay? In this paper, they talk all about social emotional learning and equity and gender equity and all of these lovely things that sound great unless you understand the people. They reference over and over again, Alice Bailey and this woman, Adele Diamond at, at University of British Columbia. But like, if you look at her background, it looks pretty deep state to me. 
I mean, it's Penn, MIT Co Brain and Cognitive Science, uh, University of Massachusetts Medical, and now UBC. So it's, it's a, a bit dark. Again, Lucius Trust, they're connected to the UN. Um, you know, they're, they're working on the one world religion. Like if we're gonna blockchain religion, it's probably gonna be this version. <laughs> um, the world, you know, the peace, love, and whatever blockchain. And, um, yeah, and this, is, this, is, this is from the book. I mean, they're talking about the pineal gland atrophying. Uh, but we know that if, if the world goodwill is working with the UN, that's UNICEF, right? UNICEF is actively putting VR headsets on children to suppress their melatonin and their disconnect to the natural world. This is a robot program working with autistic children. Okay, like that's devastating. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, to me, they're saying, oh, the kids work better with the robots, but like, it's called RoboKind, right? Like, um, and yeah, so, so this Lucius Trust is involved in UNICEF and VR headsets, and they're with the Vatican. <laughs> you know, this was, I was asking for a sign when I was in Salt Lake City if I was on the right track, and I was in the Catholic Cathedral of Mary Magdalene, and this was, this was the, the thing, and it said, okay, the Vatican is, you know, turning to the modern world and we're working with the UN. Like, we've, well, here's a stained glass window for that. So they're disconnecting children from the world. And this is tied to MIT, Curious Learning. And this is tied to dyslexia treatment, Curious Learning. It's running through Oakland schools now. I did a podcast about it. But you see, this is a child, probably in Africa. He's sitting on a little dirt hill, he has a phone. He doesn't even get a tablet or a computer. He just gets a phone. The world is all out here. He's by himself, being programmed by this phone. So yeah, these scholarship accounts, people need to look. These wallets are not what people think. And even the Heritage Foundation, they're looking at digital currency, they're framing this as a good thing, they're saying that school choice should involve mobile money and data analytics, and I don't think that they're being fully transparent with people about it. And you know, they're setting kids up for these mentors, but, the, but who's teaching who? The kids teaching the robots. So, um, oh, you know, I think this will be my last thing. You, can we play this, this clip? the flagship of which is a deal that we have closed with the Ministry of Education containing five million students using a technology called PRISM integrated in the Cardano blockchain. Every one of these students will have a digital ID called a DID, and that DID carries with it metadata that will travel with them throughout their entire academic life. And like those who left Facebook's uh, clutches of the university into the real world, uh, will actually follow them into the economic world. So as they graduate, as they go into the economy, eventually this infrastructure can be used for property, for payments, for voting, and all other manners of their economic life. And what's beautiful about this evergreen deal is it's extensible. Our priorities and goals are directly aligned with the vision and priorities and goals of the Ethiopian government. In a recently published doctrine of Ethiopia 2025, there was a bold vision to digitize the country on four pillars, the first of which was a national ID system. It is our belief that the work we have done here with PRISM and Cardano for these five million students will inevitably grow to be an inspiration and perhaps the system for 107 million Ethiopians, allowing them for the first time to globalize on equal terms with the United States, the European Union, China, and other modern developed economies. In addition to this, this system goes far beyond just identity. Our belief is that it can be used for, to help people procure jobs, to help people prove their skills, because the system can verify credentials, the system can verify certificates, the system can be used for a litany of activities which are required for people to understand who are credible actors to deal with and who have earned the right to have a job. Okay. Okay. So I just want to emphasize what he said there. So he's talking about it's aligned to the government. It's a private entity that's aligned to the government. Um, they're using your metadata from childhood and they can assert who is worthy of dealing with, who are credible actors in the space and who is worthy of having a job. So, so I think, yeah, so this is just uh, Sophia, this open cog, Cardano is working with Hanson Robotics, the Sophia, um, these evil dolls. Um, <laughs> they're feeding the data from the children into Ocean Protocol to trigger the singularity. The Sophia the robot was worked with Hanson Robotics with just Ben Gertzel, uh, Open Cog. Open Cog was funded by Jeffrey Epstein. Okay. So this this is it. Like they they need us. Like this is the time.
Like we can't, we can't pretend this isn't happening. I, I'm not saying it will all come to fruition. I'm definitely not saying any of that. Because we're powerful and life overcomes this. This is anti-life, this is non-life, this is a machine. And people are better than machines. People have the capacity that far exceeds machines. Um, I was just talking with someone just now about, we were talking about water beings and transmutation and silicon beings, and that's something that Tom Cowan talks about too, but that water can transmute and take in new information and change in a way that is beyond what silicon can ever do. And that's why they want to colonize our water beings with their silicon. So I'm, I'm not hopeless. I think, I, think, um, I think the healing is a part of this. I think honesty is a part of this. And I think a coming together. Um, because if there was anything that would unite the world, I think is the loss of natural life against. I, I was always imagining two years ago, I was like, I need a global peace movement of moms against AI. I need scrappy moms against AI. And I have to say, like, the health community, the, the, the community of families affected by you know, medical malpractice, those are the folks you guys are organized. The children, the parents, the families of children with IPs and who are struggling with physical and other issues, they're fighters. You, I mean, people are fighters. And so it's just how to mobilize. So I thank you for your time.